Sergeants, can you please start your recordings? PC recording is up. The cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Okay. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing from the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption throughout the hearing, please place all cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate. If you have testimony you wish to submit for the record, you can do so via email by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Ida Nick Miller. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Today we'll be voting on two pieces of legislation that I sponsored, both of which relate to workplace safety during the pandemic or public health emergencies. As we all know by now, COVID-19 pandemic caused by the new type of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which began to spread in 2019, late 2019, because, <clears throat> because of this virus, because this virus had not been encountered before and because it has transmitted so quickly guidelines and guidance on how to prevent viral spread changed rapidly and we learned about this as we learned about this new disease organizations such as the world Horse health organization uh, centers for disease control new york city department of health osha and other governing bodies often uh, provided new guidelines in real time Sometimes they even conflicted. And so this caused a great deal of confusion. Re recent reports demonstrate that essential frontline workers and employees from uh, hospital workers, uh, MTA workers, restaurant delivery folks, EMS, teachers, and, and so many others have shown that guidance around how to stay safe in the workplace during the pandemic has at times been inconsistent, incorrect, and, and improperly disseminated by the employers. This creates another set of issues by allowing workers to feel that they are not safe and secure in their own workplace during the time of the pandemic. The legislation proposed here attempts to address this issue. 2161A, would establish a board to review workplace health and safety guidance and issue employees and issue uh, guidance to the employees during COVID-19. This board would hold two public hearings. The board would consist of nine folks, uh, nine person panel, including a uh, labor representative. And the board would hold two public hearings over the next year from the relevant stakeholders and experts and employees of other health and safety guidance protocols that have been issued throughout the cities and other agencies. After hearing this testimony, the review board would then issue two reports assessing how an employer has, has done and responded to COVID-19 pandemic, including how effectively they have disseminated health and safety guidance to their employees and have they done so in real time. The reports would also include recommendations on how city agencies and employers can better protect workers during public health emergencies. The final report will be due on December of 21. Next, we have proposed intro 2162A would require citywide office of occupational health and safety, which is an office with the Department of Administrative Services monitored all, that they monitor all federal state and city agencies that issue workplace safety guidelines during a public health emergency. Kosh would, would be responsible for emailing any update health and safety guidance to coordinate the safety coordinators of, of the various agencies throughout the city within 24 hours of a receipt of the emails and this information. The safety and health coordinator at each agency must post new guidance to the workplace and email each employee and or use text of the new guidance to ensure their safety, as well as customize summaries of parts of the guidance most relevant to those employees and the categories that they represent. 
Finally, the health and safety coordinators would also be required to provide any education or training needed to comply with the new health safety guidelines. Together, these bills will work to make our workplace safer during the public health emergencies, in particular, COVID-19 pandemic. They will help better review and better disseminate workplace health and safety guidelines during health crisis, such as the one we are currently experiencing. I'd like to thank my staff, uh, Chief of Staff Ali Rasunajan, Legislative Director John Wani, uh, Senior Advisor Joe Goldblum, and certainly committee staff uh, who have done yeoman's work, uh, Nusa Thomas and John on, on this legislation. Uh, I, we have been joined uh, by my colleagues, Council Members Adam, Drum, Moya, and Roland, Rosenthal. Uh, Clerk, can you call the vote? Yes, Mr. Chair, good morning. This is the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Uh, roll call vote on proposed intros 2161A and 2162A. We'll start with Chair Miller. Uh, good morning, John. I proudly vote aye on all. Councilmember Drum. I vote aye. Councilmember Rosenthal. With congratulations to the chair, I vote aye. Councilmember Adams. Congratulations, Mr. Chair, I vote aye. Councilmember Moya. Congratulations, Chair, I vote aye. Councilmember Ulrich. With congratulations to the chair, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, with a vote in six, of six in, uh, in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the items are adopted. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Kirk. And uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Ulrich as well, as we can see. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And now uh, we will get on to uh, our today's hearing. Uh, once again, I am Councilmember Isaac Miller and would like to welcome everybody to today's virtual hearing on the topic of state of labor during the COVID-19 era. <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge and, and, and welcome uh, those who have joined us uh, once again, uh, my colleagues Adams, Drum, Moya, Rosenthal, and Ulrich um, for their participation and, and the work that we as, as a committee have done to keep uh, the city's workplace uh, workforce uh, safe during the pandemic. The first year of COVID-19 has been a, a hardship, illness, isolation. It has been long and it has felt endless. As we have moved toward finally vaccinating, this, vaccinating the city, it's important to remember the struggles of the laborers, the laborers and the workforce that have served us. They continue to put their own lives at risk to keep others healthy and safe. Today's hearing is designed to be a platform for labor during this impossibility, impossible times. We want to hear from the workers around the city about what they have experienced during the pandemic and the concerns and issues and the needs that still need to be addressed. To be addressed. We want to broadly understand how the pandemic has impacted labor and work, the work that they do for us here in the city of New York. What issues have dominated? What issues still remain? Which workers have been most impacted? And how the municipality and government can better support this workforce as we move forward. A key to understanding how COVID-19 has impacted and changed the workforce in New York City must be trying, as we are trying to figure out how the pandemic <clears throat> has interacted and potentially exasperated an already existing structural inequities in the labor work workforce. We know that the governor has issued a New York pause on executive order in March 2020. It created two categories of workers, essential workers and non-essential workers. Essential workers have been our frontline workers, those workers who could, could or have had to work outside the safety of their homes, even as the pandemic escalated. Our essential workers, have been our nurses, doctors, sanitation workers, transit workers, grocery clerks, essential frontline workers did not have the opportunity to work remotely every day. They put out, put on their uniforms, came out into the community, put their bodies 
on the line to serve our city and make all of our lives seamless as possible. Importantly, we also know that essential frontline workers tend to be disproportionately workers of color, women, immigrants, and other marginalized groups. The Fiscal Policy Institute study of essential workers found that 63% of the workers are women, 53% are, are immigrants, 33% are black, and 30% are Latinx. We know that the frontline workers bear higher risk of contracted COVID-19 studies have shown that these workers have also po have experienced poor mental health outcomes. A June 2020 study by the Kaiser Family Foundation, for example, found that essential workers reported more symptoms of depression, disorder, higher rates of substance abuse, higher rates of suicidal thoughts than their non-essential counterparts. We also know that frequently the most vulnerable or marginalized individuals are mostly affected by the crisis. The same is true by COVID-19. Impact, impact on workers. Existing, excuse me, to be especially with, with respect to receiving necessary PPEs in a timely fashion and now to be able to access vaccines. Finally, the committee also wants to hear from the mayor Office of Labor Relations, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and Department of Consumer and Worker Protections. We want to know what these agencies have been doing to protect and support workers, what, what grievances and challenges that they have seen coming from these workforces, what they have learned from their mistakes, and there have been many uh, made during the pandemic, and how they will better support and serve our pivotal, critical workforce as we move forward. The committee thanks the administration, workers, and labor advocates for being as, as present here today to testify. We hope that what we hear from all sides uh, is fruitful and that will help us to improve the lives of the city's workforce. Once again, I'd like to thank uh, Ali Basunajad, John Wani, Joe Goldblum, uh, and, and certainly committee staff, Musa, John, and Thomas as we move forward. Um, Kirk, if we could, uh, well, first of all, uh, Musa, if we have any instructions from council, and then we move forward with the uh, affirmation of the administration. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Thomas Nath, a policy analyst for the Committee on Civil Service and Labor at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify and please listen for your name to be called. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Uh, Steve Banks, first deputy commissioner and general counsel from the Office of Labor Relations. Don Pinnock, Executive Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Quinton Haynes from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections. I will first read the oath and after I will call on each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to CM questions? Deputy Commissioner Steve Banks, I do. Deputy Commissioner Don Pinnock. I do. Deputy Commissioner Quinton Haynes. I do. And Stephen Etnani. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Thank you, uh, Chair Miller and members of the committee for convening this hearing. Uh, my name is Stephen Banks and I serve as general counsel at the New York City Office of Labor Relations. Um, and I'm here to discuss the city's outreach and collaboration with its municipal unions, 
during the last 10 plus months of this global pandemic. And I, see, I can see that a number of our municipal local union representatives are here today, and I'm sure that this committee will hear from them as well. Um, I'm also joined today by my colleagues, Ex Executive Deputy Commissioner Don Pinnock and Exe Executive Deputy Commissioner Quentin Hayes from DCS and DCWP Executive Director of External Affairs, Stephen Etanani. Um, and they'll be assisting with uh, questions and answers. Um, in my view, uh, the Office of Labor Relations role as a central oversight agency in dealing with unions is never more important than during a crisis or emergency. Um, just in terms of the time we convened a meeting with the Municipal Labor Committee, as you know, the umbrella group of municipal unions, on February 20th of 2020, where health professionals from DOHMH um, uh, presented uh, a presentation on the COVID-19 science and answered questions from unions for several hours. And in general, our practice is to try to get our labor unions involved as early as possible since they serve as the representatives of our over 300,000 city employees. Um, that initial meeting in February of 2020 was before the city had felt the full effect of the virus and was meant to educate um, our union representatives so that they could then educate their members. Uh, as the virus fully took hold in the city in March, um, one of the steps the, we took as an employer was to establish a telework policy, which hadn't been in place before, um, which led to many of our city workers who could perform their work from home to do so. Um, as Chair Miller mentioned, um, that's not true of every employee, but um, there was a telework policy implemented for the very first time. Um, just as an example, the Office of Labor Relations has about 150 employees, and we closed our offices on March 20th and remain working remotely through today. Um, the city also established last spring a leave policy for city employees to ensure that those affected by COVID-19 would receive excused time off without charging leave balances. That policy has been updated several times and remains in place today. And eligible include those who are experiencing symptoms who may be subject to a governmental or medical quarantine or caring for another person who's subject to a quarantine or caring for a child whose school has been closed. Um, in each of those situations, uh, OLRs engaged and notified affected labor unions and provided copies of relevant policies and uh, worked with them to answer questions that have arisen over the time that those policies have been in effect. Now, we, we fully recognize that each bargaining unit within city government is truly unique in the role that they play. And our goal as an oversight agency on behalf of the mayor is to reduce disparities by treating each union and each group of employees in a fair and equitable manner while taking account of the different types of work that they do. Um, uh, going back to the spring of 2020, a major issue that we were dealing with our unions on was uh, health and safety protocols, particularly for those employees, as Chairman Miller mentioned, who continued to put on the uniform and go to work every day. Um, and this included uh, cleaning protocols at our various agencies um, for the facilities, the provision of personal protective equipment, uh, which was certainly a challenge at first, um, but ultimately we were able to procure uh, large supplies of things like masks and gloves and um, other procurements like laptops for those employees who were working at home. Um, we also worked at that time with labor unions as some municipal employees were moving functions to assist the city with the emergency. One example of that was school nurses when schools were closed, uh, moving to health and hospitals to assist with the surge there. Um, and while there are inevitable areas of disagreement between labor and management in some of these situations, our approach, uh, Commissioner Campion and, and myself on down, has been to engage our unions and work through these issues collaboratively rather than moving forward unilaterally. Um, as we transition into the summer of 2020, the city and DCAS uh, issued return to the office guidance, which was meant to educate agencies and provide some consistent citywide guidance to be that could be implemented where applicable. Um, as certain groups of employees return to in-person assignments, all our work with agencies and unions um, to ensure that union representatives were notified of changes in work location. Um, in a number of instances, union and management representatives held walkthroughs of work sites so that unions could see themselves that uh, things like social distancing and other protocols were being adhered to in the workplace. Um, we've also worked with both unions and healthcare providers to ensure that city employees have access to COVID-19 tests on a priority basis. And we've worked with DOE and their labor unions on protocols for uh, COVID-19 testing for employees who work in schools. Um, now, most recently, um, our work uh, and outreach with the unions have been, has been most focused on the distribution of the vaccine. Uh, OLR staff is present daily at the city's vaccine command center. 
so that if issues arise that require coordination with our labor unions, we're aware and we're able to immediately effectuate that communication. Um, the Vaccine Com Command Center staff is working with state officials daily to interpret and expand the definition of which city employees are eligible to be vaccinated under the current phase 1B. Um, and earlier this month, OLR, along with Deputy Mayors Wolf, Fulahan, and Hartzog, uh, again briefed the, the MLC Steering Committee um, on behalf of the entire workforce on the city's vaccination efforts. And again, the goal is to involve labor in the discussion early and make sure the unions have access to the latest and most accurate information. Um, in support of our vaccination effort, the city as an employer recently issued a policy which allows for city employees to receive uh, excuse time during the workday to go and receive the vaccine um, and also provides for three hours of compensatory time to any employee who's received both doses. Um, we also specifically added vaccine side effects to the list of reasons for excuse time under the policy that I mentioned earlier. Um, we've also taken steps to educate our workforce directly about the vaccine. The Vaccine Command Center has hosted five teletown halls for city employees with Dr. Jay Varma providing general information about the vaccine and answering questions that employees submit. Um, we plan to continue those education efforts so that we can address concerns some employees may have and encourage as much of our workforce to get vaccinated as possible. This is all uh, part of the city's effort to make sure that employees are supported in making the decision to receive the vaccine. Um, ultimately, we truly believe that uh, labor unions are our partners in this effort, and we work every day at cultivating the relationships with our labor colleagues and working together with uh, the city's municipal unions. I want to thank uh, Council Member Miller and the members of the committee again for holding a hearing on this important topic, and we'll answer whatever questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, we will now turn it over to Chair Miller for questions. Tom, are we, are we going to hear from the uh, other first deputies? The other city agencies are here to assist with uh, Q&A. Okay, good. Uh, so um, if, if, if we could kind of uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you for uh, the work over the past nearly year now. And it's, 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 it's amazing that we've been doing this for so long uh, at, at this point. Um, but before we work our way up to present day and, and vaccine, we, we, we do want to uh, kind of reference a few things as, as to how we got here. But part of this uh, hearing is also uh, about equity and, and ensuring that, that our entire workforce is, is being treated with the dignity and respect and equity that they deserve. And, and so um, I know that, first off, uh, does the administration agree with the legislation that was put forth today, 2161 and 2162, uh, that, that uh, was voted on? Uh, is that something that the administration looks to support? I, I mean, I would defer to my colleagues at uh, City Legislative Affairs, but I know that uh, council staff and mayor's office staff were involved in negotiating a lot of the terms of uh, those particular provisions. So I know a lot of it, a lot of the terms were agreed upon, but I can't speak to the final version. Okay. And, and, I, and I would say that because uh, when we were with OLR and, and DCAS, but specifically with OLR, we were having regular meetings back in in, in March, April, uh, during uh, May, during the height of the pandemic, and and there were um, notices and and changes in, in public health policies coming down pretty rapidly. Um, there was some concern about whether or not uh, the, the the administration, particularly OLR, had the capacity to put them out in real time, and that there were a number of agencies that that uh, they did different, they different work. Um, you had to figure out what was relevant and, and, and whether or not that could happen. Honestly, that was really the nexus for, we were very much concerned and that was the nexus for, for the legislation itself. Uh, I will say, um, having worked with, with DCAS on this matter and, and being the, the, the agency responsible for kind of aggregating this data and, and, and getting it out, um, that I was, uh, uh, 
a little more confident uh, that the workforce would ultimately uh, have some of the, the, the technical resources and support that they needed. And I just, as a matter of backdrop, um, you know, I know there were agencies uh, that, you know, that were dealing with the public that uh, initially didn't want the workforce wearing masks because it deterred the public from coming in or utilizing the service. Then, you know, subsequently, uh, once that had, once the, the guidelines came down that, 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 that showed that, you know, the, 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 the mask was necessary, um, then the, the, the workforce was allowed to wear masks, but the public wasn't required to wear masks, even uh, in, in, in some of the uh, HRA centers and, and, and others, and, and clearly, you know, took a while for public transportation, which we know to be the epicenter of, of the spread of the virus as well. And so, you know, that took a moment. And, and so um, we were trying, what we were looking for was coordination uh, amongst agencies. So we have a number of questions a around that. Um, how did that happen? Um, how did we get to the point that we, we were able to have some type of get this information out in real time uh, to the relevant agencies? And, and that went from everything from from the uh, accessing PPEs, the use of PPEs, when and where PPEs should be used. Uh, 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 EMS, uh, for instance, uh, are responsible for charge with cleaning their own cabs and, and, and the trucks. You know, uh, how do you clean the cab? What do you clean it with during the time of COVID? Were they properly instructed? When were they instructed? You know, things like that is, is was really again the nexus of the legislation. Are we satisfied that we we, we kind of uh, met that goal in doing so, and and not just with the legislation, but that obviously this was in in very early times, but that we're able to turn around this information coming from these health and science governing bodies, and get it where it needs to be in in real time. Yeah, so I agree, Chair Miller, that, you know, that uh, communication is obviously, um, it's a challenge and it's also really important, right? So in terms of the city as an employer, right, we have multiple streams. Um, Dawn and her team at DCAS um, push out any new relevant city policies to all agencies through the agency personnel officers, which is usually like a, an HR lead for each agency. Um, and then uh, they've also been holding since the pandemic started um, weekly calls with all the agency personnel officers where they can ask questions. And I, you know, I usually participate along with some of Dawn's staff in answering questions from agencies. So that's one way that we push information out to agencies. And then our office, OLR, um, anytime uh, workforce related policies come out, um, we share them with our uh, labor unions, the leadership of our, of our unions. And that's another way to get them out to the workforce. So um, obviously, you know, uh, it's always a challenge. Um, and there's a lot of city agencies, some big, some small. Um, but getting information out there um, is critically important, right? And then um, separate from those streams, right? I know that there have been websites um, originally um, for just for COVID-19 information on nyc.gov and more recently for stuff like vaccine specific information that employees can access directly. Um, so, but certainly the more um, different modes of communication, the better. So we agree completely with you on that point. So, so that, yeah, that we're talking about you know, that would be general information, but industry agency specific information. Um, how, how, do, how do we disseminate that information? Are we satisfied that, that we reach all of our target audience as we talked about some of the, the very specifics and nuances of, of, of cleaning materials, PPEs, what is social distancing? How do you social distance within, you know, uh, the, the, the confines of, of, of occupational uh, uh, condition? Um, have we clearly defined what those conditions are be between each agencies and how, how do, how were we able to and, and continue to get that information out in real time when information, when, when things change as rapidly as they were? Yeah, so on, on health and safety specifically, um, again, there's going to be a wide variance between our larger agencies. We'll have dedicated health and safety offices and officers, right, where our smaller agencies might have people who wear multiple hats and do health and safety, among other functions. And then I think you mentioned in your opening remarks, Chair Miller, that there's also going to be a distinction 
um, uh, between different agencies in terms of the function that they perform, whether the Department of Sanitation or the Parks Department or the Police Department that essentially never shut down and had employees reporting to work every day in last March, April, May, and beyond, there's going to be a different approach um, than an agency like OLR, where employees have been um, remote and only occasionally or voluntarily appearing at the office, uh, our office on Cortland Street, um, where we have, you know, made some preparations, but it's obviously not as acute. So I, I think it will vary from agency to agency. And I don't know if Dawn wants to add anything. DCAS also has the, uh, the citywide office of occupational safety and health um, that has some oversight uh, role uh, within city government. So um, I won't answer um, necessarily about um, the citywide office for safety and health because I do think that um, Council Member Miller, in your remarks, you talked about how they work directly with our health and safety coordinators at every agency. What I would say is that um, similar to what um, Steve mentioned, when we draft our policies, we certainly draft them with the intent to cover every situation. However, every workspace is different. Um, job functions will vary. And so we do um, leave room for agencies to incorporate those agency specific elements to ensure that they are taking our policy to that next level. So really our policy should really serve as a foundation. So if there are definitions specifically around what social distancing means, we would follow a definition that is actually, you know, reported by the CDC or Department of Health. So we would make sure that that guidance is there. But if we're talking about um, the, the aspects of a very specific workplace um, or um, some speci specificities relating to a job title, that would be an area where the agency step in. And so that's the reason why we've been working literally every week, we have a standing meeting with our HR professionals. Um, I can tell you um, that that has certainly ramped up communications with that team because we want them to serve as a central hub to ensure that every employee gets the same information regardless of job title. And so um, as part of those weekly forums, we talk about any changes to policy, um, anything that we're seeing that's changing as it relates to CDC regulations. Um, we discuss things that may be upcoming just to give them a heads up, but we also open ourselves for ongoing dialogue in the event that they have an agency specific issue where they believe that they need us as an oversight agency to help them navigate. So, so in, in, in that case, knowing that you guys are responsible for, for providing the overall kind of guidelines and then and and then technical or support on on specific uh implementation of that depending on what that workforce looks like uh um where does the oversight come from when once once the information even the, the just the the, the rarest inf the, the um not the rare but the the rarest information the the the, the most fundamental generic information goes to 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 the agencies um and then um it is kind of contoured to the specific needs and or services that are being provided by that workforce where does that where does is there any oversight for for agencies to ensure that that they are complying with notifications. Num number one, that notifications are being posted and, and disseminated to the workforce, but also that they're making the proper adjustments uh, uh, that are necessary. I, I, do we just push it out? And, and you know, if, if, if you don't have um, currently your, your, your workers comp, your disability information posted, you know, you're subject to, to, to penalties, right? What happens if we're not posting this information that comes out that, that you know, around uh, this workplace health and safety as it relates to COVID? Where's the oversight? Well, certainly from, from my standpoint, one practical area that there, um, that the oversight comes up is that we have our labor unions, right? And I see a number are represented uh, here today. I see, you know, Anthony Wells and Sean Francois and a, a union like DC 37 has employees at every city agency. So obviously if there's an agency or a bureau within an agency um, where there are ish, health and safety issues where, um, you know, let's say some of their protocols are out of whack with what's being done uh, in the rest of the city. Certainly one way that our office, OLR, um, becomes aware of it is through our labor partners, right? And I'm not saying it's necessarily their job to provide oversight, but that's one practical way that we, um, that uh, there's sort of an enforcement 
of the general idea of uh, consistency, fairness, and equity. Um, and so we've had those issues uh, arise. I was on a call uh, a couple of weeks ago with some of uh, Anthony's uh, reps and attorneys about an issue at a particular agency, and we were able to talk through it and work through some of the issues. So that's certainly one way that it arises. And I don't know if my colleagues from DCAS, Quentin or Dawn, um, want to add anything about how um, uh, our city agencies um, adhere to whatever protocols are out there. Uh, apparently not, but now that you mentioned that, that those those bargaining unit representatives that are out there, from an OLR perspective, how, how many outstanding or or even resolved grievances as relate to COVID nineteen uh, have you received? Yeah, so as general counsel, right, I see all of the grievances that come up for arbitration. And um, I think that COVID-19 related grievances, I would say that there's probably, um, you know, less than five that have come to arbitration and um, they're probably all still pending, um, you know, uh, related to issues around um, health and safety or returning to the office or stuff like that, which, you know, considering that we have 150 different bargaining units and there's plenty, you know, I, I see plenty of disciplinary and out of title grievances um, coming up to arbitration, I think is a testament to that most of the issues we've been able to either resolve at a local level between the agency and the shop steward, um, or if it does get escalated, then it might come to OLR where it might be more of a union president to OLR issue, but we've, we've been able to resolve those issues by and large in the labor management context. And there's been, you know, I, I would say uh, very little grievance activity. But so, so as you, as you mentioned, return to work, uh, it's, 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 is, is what, one of the things that we're concerned about from a committee perspective here is, is equity and, and, and whether or not each agency is, is treated with the same dignity and respect by, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and policy and whether or not the return to work. Um, I've, I've heard from 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 bargaining units and, and union members that they were kind of like forced back to work. They got to work and supervisors were not at work and to supervise them um, that they were and sometimes, you know, uh, f forced to use uh, their own leave entitlements for COVID related uh, time loss. And, and is, is that is, 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 are those inequities something that you see or is that something uh, by virtue that occurs by virtue of, of, of negotiation or renegotiation or amendments of terms and conditions of, of, of work rules uh, based on, on, on the pandemic? How, how have you negotiated with, with, with all of the bargaining units or are you negotiating with the Municipal Labor Council how has that happened, these change of conditions of employment that we have seen by virtue of COVID-19? How, how did they occur? Sure. So there's a few different uh, aspects to your question. One is, um, you know, the idea of employees having to use their own time for COVID-related absence really shouldn't be the case. We do have a, po a citywide policy that um, provides for excused leave for, and I mentioned, you know, just a few of the categories, right? If someone is obviously, if they're positive, testing positive, if they're just symptomatic, if they're uh, ordered to quarantine um, by either their own doctor or by, you know, like the Department of Health, for instance, all of those are reasons under our policy for people to get excused leave. So that shouldn't happen, but it probably goes to uh, what I was talking about a few minutes ago about communication and making sure that people are aware of those benefits, right? Because in order to get that leave, you have to request it and you have to know about it. Um, uh, you also mentioned, um, you know, uh, issues from agency to agency. And I think uh, Dawn touched on that a few minutes ago where um, as oversight agencies, as the Office of Labor Relations and DCAS and the law department who's not here, right? We, we provide um, foundational uh, guidance to the agencies, right? Um, in exactly the same situation, there should be the same, it should trickle down to the same policies, right? There are unique aspects of our different jobs and work sites throughout the city, right? Even when you think about social distancing in the workplace, right? A DEP uh, sewage treatment plant isn't gonna be the same as a firehouse. It's not gonna be the same as an office at the Muni building, right? There, there is definitely some uniqueness among both our job duties and our work sites. And that's gonna lead to 
uh, different approaches. Um, the issue that you raised about um, employees being called to come into the office and no supervisors, that, that seems like it shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't happen if we need to talk offline about a specific agency or situation that came to your uh, attention, Chair Miller, we can certainly do that. I don't know if there's some extenuating reason why one employee might be absent and another employee might be there, but that's something that we could look into. Um, and then lastly, you know, the issue of inequality, right? Certainly the, um, you know, as an administration, we've often said that, that COVID-19 has um, brought to light inequities throughout society in our city and that the virus has uh, disproportionately impacted women, people of co color, working class people. Um, for the city as an employer, recognizing what I mentioned a few moments ago, that each job function is unique and we have consistent policies and procedures, the differing nature of, of different work functions will sometimes necess necessitate a different response um, during the emergency. And obviously, you know, I don't think it's disputed that some functions that city government performs can adequately be performed remotely and others um, need to be uh, in person. And we, we have had discussions at various points with individual labor unions about agencies' approaches to that. Um, and I think the key overall for the city as an employer is to be flexible and reasonable and to treat um, all employees, no matter what their job function is, with the um, respect and dignity that they deserve. Sorry, in, in, in terms of those negotiations and, 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 and policy changes, uh, they, they occurred on individual by individual unions, and each individual union had been uh, uh, specifically negotiated with around the changes in their work conditions based on COVID-19, or is, is um, it unilateral? So, I mean, I think the decisions as to whether a given employee or unit is, for example, work, working from home, right? Most of those decisions were initially made last March, right? Those are generally made by management, but we communicate them with whatever unions might be affected. So, for example, um, we did have, I think, in the late summer and early fall, some small pockets of city employees who had been at home returning to the office, right? And in those situations our message to agencies was to engage every affected union, right? Because in one work site, there might be, you know, 20 employees, but it might be five different unions represented, right? So our instructions to the agencies were to brief all the affected unions on what the plans are, lay it out for them, um, allow them to do what I mentioned in my testimony, which is walkthroughs of the work site beforehand. So, I mean, I wouldn't say from a, a technical standpoint, that's negotiations, but it's collaboration and notification and then if the union has issues and those situations did arise where we had these walkthroughs and they said, well, we don't like that there's, you know, four people in this room. We think that it's not uh, compliant with social distancing. Maybe there's some uh, reconfiguring of the workspace um, to accommodate that. Right. So it's it's working alongside our labor partners um, because, you know, um, the unions are spokespeople for the workers themselves. Right. And so we want to work with them and have a, a collaborative um, cooperative agreement to move forward um, with our labor unions and thereby with our employees. So, so uh, let me just ask that my, my colleagues who, who, who have questions, uh, please use the raise hand function because clearly there's, there's a lot to unpack here and I want to make sure that we're hearing from everyone. Um, so, and, and, and I'm glad you raised that because not only do we have a number of bargaining units sometimes working within uh, the same agency, but sometimes we have various agencies working within the same facilities, right? And, and you know, I, I know last week uh, we had, um, and this may, you know, non uh, Merrill agency, so it may be a little different, but uh, we, we had a, a, a COVID potential outbreak uh, at the Board of Elections, uh, and you had one or two agencies that addressed the uh, uh, crisis, number one, in a, in, in, and gave it the urgency that it deserved. It also brought the resources that it deserved, and you had somebody else who did neither. And that, nor did they address it in a timely fashion. Uh, how often does it occur that you have a situation like that? First of all, like you mentioned the first time, 
a situation where you have multiple bargaining units working within the same agency, but you have different agencies working within the same building and you get different guidelines uh, for those different agencies. I, I think that's also what we're trying to get to here, that whether or not there's, there needs to be uniformity, but where there needs to be specific, the specifics, that needs to occur as well. Um, and, and and I know that it, it sounds like a lot, but this is life and death, right? And, and that people can't have uh, such vastly uh, different um, policies as it relates to uh, public health. And, you know, what are we doing to ensure that that does not occur? Um, and have we identified situations in which um, those uh, diverse policies exist? Yeah, so I mean, certainly from my office's standpoint, um, in the situation you described, there should be consistency and uniformity uh, amongst the agencies. I know that we have, you know, certainly our office was involved in coordinating, you know, one example um, was the Peace Act, the Public Safety Answering Center, right, where there are employees of the police department and the department and do it, right? We worked with all of those agencies. And obviously it's more complicated when there's three sets of managers as opposed to one. Um, but because that building held employees from all three agencies, we work with them to establish a policy um, early on in the pandemic, have temperature checks coming in, right, and establish a policy where, you know, one group of employees wasn't prioritized over the other, but, and there also weren't long lines and, and stuff like that. So um, where possible, I think interagency coordination is appropriate. I'm not familiar with the specific situation, um, yeah, but um, uh, in, in like, you know, if all else is equal, um, the agency should handle those situations uh, similarly. So um, we agree with that. And so if there are issues like that arise, um, our office and DCAS, our oversight agencies, um, that can try to help uh, with that consistency. Uh, w. Commission, you, you, you also mentioned that what we have seen uh, over the past Near a year now is or, or some of the inequities that have manifested itself uh, because of COVID and its impact on uh, certain communities that have been historically marginalized and, and underrepresented. Um, clearly, we've seen the same with, with workforces. Uh, can, can, can you identify some of the inequities that you've seen uh, throughout city agencies and, and what you have done? what the administration has done to, to mitigate or rectify or make those uh, uh, workers or workforce whole? So, I mean, in terms of the city workforce, right, I think the main differences in terms of employees' response is going to be based on the, the job function that they perform. Um, and I know, you know, early on in your comments and in some of these questions and answers, right, the issue of working remotely versus in person um, has been raised, right? And we recognize that there are going to be differing results and approaches based on the different work that uh, a city employee performs as part of the overall structure of providing services for our residents, right? You mentioned like the Department of Sanitation, right? We, we have to be in person to pick up the trash. A firefighter can't work remotely, right? There are other job functions that, um, and maybe the, the pandemic has pushed us to this point, where we recognize that, um, right, you know, at or close to full 100% productivity um, while working remotely, right? So um, that's a difference that's not as a result of gender or race or, um, you know, economic condition. It's going to be a, a result that's dictated by the employee's job function. But um, obviously, that's a challenge, right? That's going to lead to um, uh, different experiences for different employees. And I think that that's, you know, it's inevitable, but um, obviously that's something that we um, have been working our way through um, since this started. Um, and hopefully as we move forward to people getting vaccinated and being in a post COVID-19 world, uh, I think that um, uh, OLR and DCAS and the law department are gonna have to talk about whether a permanent ongoing telework policy is appropriate. And we have to think about issues like that uh, inequity um, and the result of which employees could potentially take advantage of a, of a program like that versus who couldn't, even when we're outside of the pandemic. So we, what, what we have seen, quite frankly, 
uh, 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 very early on uh, are those who has, has quite frankly, you know, for, for, for lack of a, for better terms, uh, you know, here we're talking about working class professionals who, who have options that, that folks that deliver services that require them to leave their home and, and, and be on the ground are, are treated differently. And, and, and clearly we're talking about uh, specifically with you and, and DCAS, the, the city's workforce and, you know, but this, this, this hearing is a little broader than that. And, and we have delivery folks and private sectors folks and, and retail workers that we're gonna hear from uh, Worker Protect. We'd like to hear from them as well in, in doing so and in, in, in those in, inequities, but there are some historical inequities even within, you know, uh, uh, workforces and, you know, FDNY and, you know, uh, and, and, and those hi historical inequities that, that exist there and, and the work that has been done and, 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 and who's answering calls and, and, and the responsibilities and the additional responsibilities of, of EMS and and you know we've been talking about that for the last five years, uh, equity and compensation and I think no, uh, n there's been no greater demonstration of the injustice there than the work that has been done by this workforce during uh, COVID-19 where they have undertaken uh, a, a plethora of additional tasks and not necessarily got compensated or been specifically tra trained to answer the, the, the number of calls, the types of calls, the particularly around the mental health challenges that they're now asked to do, uh, whether or not their counterparts at FDNY are answering the level or any of the uh, covert related, respiratory related calls. And that, that charge uh, lays specifically with them. Um, certainly, one, one would surmise that there's an inequity there, but also uh, at, at so many different levels, but we knew that going in, right? That, that there was this disparities around compensation and we've been having that conversation. And I would hope now that, you know, we, we, we say in this world that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, that, that there's room for that conversation as, as we move through that. And I was just looking at, you know, the, the council has a, a plethora of things going on and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna just want to raise my hand and, and vote on the other side, and and so um, if I could just before hearing from worker protections, uh, if 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 uh, DCAS could talk about some of the work that they have done around policy, around the the, the guideline, the workplace guidelines, because one thing that I have not seen uh, is, and and they've been very good at you know, the shutdowns, the reopening, what the guidelines look around, look around that and getting that information out. And, 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 and for many folks, including my staff and others have taken advantage of a lot of their law online instruction, but were there any uh, instructions available for agencies, managers, even folks like myself that, that uh, uh, professional development around remote working from home, right? Because th th there's this zealousness and, 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 and uh, folks are eager to do it, uh, passionate about the work that they do. And I think that passion got us through the first month or two, but afterwards, um, we, we, we are now realizing that we are being tasked and challenged to do something that we aren't really uh, uh, physically, emotionally trained and prepared to do, right? Which is to, to provide services remotely. Um, has the city done anything to, to retrain the workforce uh, to remote service delivery? So thank you for that question. Um, I would say I've been trying to write notes because uh, over this time that we've been, you know, remote, there have been so many things that um, DCAS has done, you know, um, as an agency, but also in partnership mm -hmm. with OLR, with OMB, and with the law department. So um, one of the things that we did, uh, and I know that Steve referenced this, was the fact that we put together some return to office guidance. So really a part of that was to bring all the agencies together in a town hall format, which we did, and we host 
we hosted a series of training sessions. Um, I can certainly double check my attendee list, but generally the council also has a standing invitation to any of those meetings because we also have a standing invitation um, to the council as it relates to our HR leads meeting that we conduct on a weekly basis. So in those particular meetings, um, well, those town halls, we talked about four main areas. We talked about preparation of your building, your workspace, how do you prepare the staff and communication? So I think those last two areas is, is where you're going. Um, so in terms of preparing our workforce, we really don't view it as um, a retraining, but more like an upskilling, right? Because this is a completely new environment for all of us. And so the guidance that we offer to agencies specifically around the workforce was making sure that people were um, knowledgeable, of lead policies, really using HR as a central hub as it related to knowledge around how can you properly charge your time and take care of yourself and your family, but also to bring in our equity and inclusion professionals also as another body, our EEO body, as it relates to the processing of even reasonable accommodations, because that is certainly also another option that is afforded to employees who have a documented disability. But even beyond that, we went through communication and that ties in with what you said around engagement. Um, we do understand that a remote environment is difficult um, for many people for a lot of reasons. So one of the things that we do is remind our employees of the services offered through the Employee Assistance Program, who work well at NYC, because they've also ramped up their efforts in order to provide um, individuals with coping skills as they deal with disconnection, feelings of loss. But separate and apart from that, we've also um, ramped up uh, just having um, information that we posted in, in addition to that relating to just guidance on how do you manage in a remote environment. You know, our instructions have really tied into trying your best to replicate what would have happened in office, but doing that remotely. So we talk about proper use of technology. How do you track productivity? How do you engage um, um, your employees in meaningful conversation, especially if you think that that employee is struggling? How do you do your check-ins in a way where people don't feel checked up on, but they feel cared after? So certainly that is guidance that we provided to um, managers and supervisors and made that available to our HR leads. Um, and certainly if that is information that we can share with you, um, happy to do that. I mean, we came up with a very simple, quick one pager that really walked people through um, areas of engagement. Thank you. Um, has there been any age specific agencies that have reached out to you for that type of professional development and training for their workforce? So I would say there's been a cross section. I mean, certainly we are in communication with DOB quite often um, because, you know, they actually have a pretty um, solid training platform. However, folks sometimes just want to bounce ideas off of us. Um, uh, I would say that in some cases, HRA, just because they're so decentralized. And so in some cases, they may want to ask, how could engagement be uh, improved, especially with their folks who are working um, not in their central office location? Internally to DCAS, we've had to think about how we, we print flyers. And I know that that, you know, you know, it may sound wasteful, but it's effective. We want to make sure that our employees know the benefits that are afforded to them. We send them cards at the time that we know that they are not well. We've sent them uh, wallet size cards to put in their wallets, which include all of their leave information because we understand they are on the front lines and they don't have the benefit of having a laptop directly in front of them. And so those are some of the best practices we've also shared with agency partners. And just to add to what Dawn said, she mentioned uh, during her uh, early on in her answer, the city's employee assistance program, right, which is a part of OLR that I'm really proud of, where we have licensed social workers that service city employees um, who might be experiencing mental health or uh, substance abuse issues. Um, and, you know, I can report, you know, uh, in terms of overseeing that group, that our EAP group has never been busier, right? And a lot of it has been related to the COVID-19 pandemic and challenges like Chair Miller said about working from home. Um, and I think part of it is word of mouth uh, across agencies um, where uh, EAP, you know, is getting a reputation as a resource that can be really effective for city employees. And then even more recently, right, with everything that happened at the Capitol and people's anxiety and stress about that, there, there was a whole nother sort of series of uh, referrals to EAP. So that's another resource that's out there for our, our employees uh, that, you know, like I said, we're really proud of. And I think um, throughout the last year, they've been um, doing, you know, really important work and have been as busy as they've ever been.
Uh, Chair Miller, I believe you're on mute. I, I, I had to jump in. I, I apologize. I had a, a vote in land use and, and I just did that, but I'm listening and I, 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 I appreciate that. Um, so um, can, 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 can we hear from uh, worker protection on some of the things that, that they're hearing from, from some of the private sector unions and, and the non-represented people and what they're doing to support workers uh, and, and what kind of grievance that, the grievances have they seen uh, over the past 10 months as it relates to uh, workforce uh, health and safety uh, during uh, the pandemic? Thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate the question. Um, I want to just actually touch on something that, that, that you were uh, that you alluded to earlier in the terms of you know, racial uh, equity and how this um, pandemic in so many ways has uh, magnified uh, uh, inequities that already exist in the city for, for, for years and years. Um, at DCWP, our, our mission and our primary focus is to enforce the municipal workplace laws that, that we're charged with. Um, as you know, our laws never lapsed. Uh, they were never suspended. Um, by executive order or otherwise during the pandemic. And in so many cases, um, their enforcement has been pivotal uh, to ensuring that um, essential workers, those on the front lines, those that are, as you know, so often lower, to lower class or working class folks, um, immigrant folks, our most vulnerable populations are being protected and well-resourced. Um, we have specific examples actually of working with um, folks in, in uh, private sector unions uh, that have made um, substantive referrals to us that have resulted in enforcement actions that of course have led to uh, money being returned to uh, folks' pockets. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, and I know Chair, um, you championed this bill, the, the Grocery Worker Retention Act. Uh, we worked with our colleagues our, uh, with, uh, with um, RWDSU rather, um, and received a referral about a, about a key food um, in the Bronx that um, was in violation of that law. Um, because of those tips, because of our communications with private sector unions, for example, in this case, we were able to return nearly $100,000 um, in returned wages to, to workers. Um, that's just one example of how we're leveraging, um, you know, consistent and, and, and constant communication with our, with our uh, union partners in the city. Um, we also have worked, for example, with, with 32BJ um, on a myriad of different cases, including uh, ones at Chipotle, for example. Um, and most recently this past July, um, as it related to airline service workers who uh, were um, basically, uh, I guess their employer were, was in violation of the paid safe and sick leave laws. And we were able to return again money uh, to those workers' pockets. So in short, I think, you know, for us and what we've been hearing, uh, unfortunately, is that, you know, we have so many incredible cases where um, employers have, have done the right thing. They've they've resourced their workers. They've let them know they about their rights and and been communicative with them. Um, but in the cases where we have unscrupulous employers or uh, ones that aren't following the letter of the law, we're relying on our private sector unions. Um, we're taking affirmative actions in in some cases as well to ensure that our workplace laws that the council, you know, thankfully uh, passed. Uh, years ago in some cases uh, to protect essential employees are being enforced um, because now more than ever, paid time off is so critical. Predictable scheduling is so critical. And as you know, um, the council just recently um, passed and the mayor signed just cause protections to ensure that there aren't arbitrary firings for fast food workers, another um, segment of essential workers um, working class New Yorkers that um, we think will 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 have far reaching impacts to ensure that that these folks aren't um, you know needlessly objectified or or uh, or uh, taken advantage of. So 
Uh, we thank the council for that work and, and we're certainly working with our union partners to, to ensure that, um, you know, where, where are cases that these folks are, are, are getting shortchanged that we're getting money back to them as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, so um, we, we have a long day. We had so many panelists. I, I would just, before, before I ask my final questions to the administration, I would just ask that someone hang around because we have union folks uh, that, that are going to speak about some of their concerns and grievances. We want to make sure that they're, they're being heard. Often what happens is, you know, the administration comes on and, and they paint a picture or, or, or they speak their truth. And, and then the unions come on and, and, and it's, it's a bit of a different story. And while we don't want to debate the merits of that during the course of the hearing, we need for you to hear from the people that represent the workforce that is serving New York City in this most, uh, during their most vulnerable time. And, 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 and really, you know, uh, the grievances, you may not have the grievance in front of you. Uh, there may be some things that occur in the real time uh, but I think uh, it, it, is, it is very important that, that you hang around and hear what they have to say so that we can uh, collectively put our resources together to make sure that we're, we're serving workers. Um, and, and so with that, I, I, I want to talk about uh, vaccine distribution and, and uh, what that looks like, uh, uh, how exactly uh, that is occurring. I, I know that there is a, you know, there's a, a, a state mandate, what that compliance looks like, but also what flexibility does the city have in determining what workers are essential. Let me just say, when we talk about equity and inclusion, um, what we've learned in order for us to exist and, and those folks that, that make our lives so seamless day to day, give us the quality of life that we deserve, often go unnoticed, right? And they have been noticed uh, during this pandemic and we've raved about them greatly, uh, but often when it comes time to compensate them, it doesn't happen. When it comes time to provide them with the PPE, it doesn't happen. When it comes time for, 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 for uh, vaccination, it is not happening and that you have folks who have the opportunity by virtue of profession or privilege who have jumped the line been vaccinated and retreat to the enclaves of privilege. And, and these folks that have to go out each and every day and work outside of their community, potentially affecting themselves, their families and their communities, um, have to wait until March to, to, be, to be vaccinated, right? So what is that process? What can we do differently? Uh, what impediments are, they, are there from getting those folks uh, who, suffer these inequities uh, and, and, and that we can ultimately uh, prevent what the surge that we've seen uh, with the lack of PPEs, with the people who, because these are the same folks that are coming from the communities that are, are most impacted. We tomorrow uh, will be uh, introducing a resolution um, that calls for a real time distribution of once again, information and data uh, to ensure that communities that were most impacted, that the workforce that was most impacted uh, has access to the vaccine. Uh, what, have, what can we do as a city to, to mitigate those inequities and what has the administration done to ensure that these bargaining unit folks and otherwise that are providing these critical services have access to the vaccine? Sure. Thanks, Chair Miller. So I'll, I'll speak about the city uh, as an employer and our current efforts, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague Steve to talk, uh, add anything uh, relevant in the private sector in terms of uh, vaccine distribution. So um, I mentioned during my testimony, right, that there's a vaccine command center um, that's been run out of City Hall, and uh, our office um, has a representative at the vaccine command center every day. Um, and so right now, um, we're in phase 1B of the vaccine distribution. Um, so included in that group, are um, some major categories of city employees, um, teachers and education workers, first responders, public safety workers, public transit workers, and uh, congregated shelter staff. And so we employees in all of those categories. And so um, you're right, Chair Miller, that the state 
um, has the primary responsibility to determine who's eligible under a given phase at a given time. Um, but the city's in constant communication and uh, essentially we're pushing for more and more city employees to be interpreted to be included in that group. Um, as I understand it, the major challenge um, that uh, everyone throughout the state, but the city in particular is having right now is with vaccine supply, right? And I know that there are um, constant conversations going on through different channels. Um, and I, you know, you've heard the mayor speak about that on an almost daily basis. Um, so from the city standpoint, we want as many of our workers as possible to get vaccinated, right? We recognize that right currently and, you know, for the foreseeable future, we're not mandating them. So part of that is for those groups who are eligible um, that employees choose to get vaccinated. And so I mentioned some of our education efforts where we try to get the word out there, um, you know, through various channels um, and make people feel comfortable with uh, getting the vaccine because it's for the benefit of themselves their families and also the city residents at large um, to have those uh, those city workers vaccinated at, at as high of a level as we can get to. Um, so those are the you know our current uh, ongoing efforts uh, as far as I understand them for the for the city workforce. You know, and there, there's also as a practical matter, there's five sites set up throughout the city that are for city workers only um, to, to get vaccinated, and so only city workers can make appointments at, at those places, and uh, you know. Um, hopefully that leads to more and more city staff uh, getting the vaccine. Um, okay. And I'll let colleague Steve uh, speak about uh, this, the administration's efforts with regard to the private side. Is, is, yeah. that, is that one in each borough? Yeah, it's a, it's a large high school. Uh, yeah, there's one large high school essentially in each borough. Okay. And, and, and that is specifically for, for the municipal workforce. That's right. And everyone who is within those prescribed categories is available to access that uh, the the the, uh, the vaccine from from that center. Yeah, uh, pending supply, right? If we have the vaccines, then yes. Yeah. So we were going for a couple of weeks, right, where everyone who's eligible in one B can make appointments at those places to get vaccinated. And what is the appointment? What what, what does that look like? Because I've received several appointments. I'm sorry, several calls that said that their appointments was a month out, and 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 in the meantime, they they got to go to work every day, right? Or, or even as far out is is nearly you know six weeks out. What does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, I can talk to the vaccine command center folks, Chair Miller, and get back to you today about what the the time would look like. I had not heard that, but I can verify sort of what the turnaround and, time. And, and have we prioritized? Are there folks working remotely that is on this list that can access the vaccine? No, I mean the teachers and education workers are eligible to get vaccinated, right? So there are some classrooms that have been closed down for one reason or another that are remote where the teacher might be at home that teacher is still eligible right but by and large the categories of employees that we're talking about if a teacher if the teacher has elected to stay home for the duration and won't be back in the building till september they're are not they eligible they're not getting vaccinated you sure about that my yeah my understanding is if an employee for example is on a reasonable accommodation and can't can't come in and work, they would not get vaccinated. But if a teacher, if a teacher's class has been remote, um, because remember a lot of kid, a lot of students chose the remote options, right? Right. Student, if a teacher happens to be remote because either temporarily or for a longer period of time, their class is remote, but they, but they personally are eligible to come into the school, right? Based on reassignments and stuff like that. So, so you talked about teachers, are there any, are there any other titles? Cause we would not, are there any other titles of folks that are working remotely um, that, that folks, that those folks are, are, are now qualified uh, for 1A uh, un, under these current guidelines and, and are being, and, and who's monitoring that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay, uh, so I, I guess we could we we could go on to uh, before we go on to to, to private sector. Um, you mentioned that you were working with leadership to expand um, 
access to the vaccine for for, for the municipal workforce? Uh, how, what is the what what is those negotiations or what 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 is the, what does that engagement look like? What are you doing collectively to try to expand that? And and what do those efforts look like? Do you think that by the time the the next round of vaccines arrive here in the city that this workforce um, that is still working, not remotely, um, and having contact with the public, but having met the 1A requirement, uh, you know, how soon are we going to see them get vaccinated? Yeah, so um, those conversations are between, you know, uh, city officials, city hall, and, and the governor's office, right? And it's about which functions and titles that the city employs fall into those five categories that I mentioned before, right? Teachers and education workers and first responders and public safety, public transit. And, and what are first responders? How do you define them? Yeah, so I mean, some examples, right, of employees who fall into that category are NYPD, both uniform staff and folks like the 911 call takers, um, the fire department, right? Uh, we have firefighters and dispatchers and uh, EMS was actually in group 1A, not 1B. Um, parks enforcement employees who are out there in the field, uh, like urban park rangers and parks enforcement patrol, a uh, child protective workers, right? I'm, I mentioned, uh, saw Anthony Wells on the call, um, the child protective workers who are out there in the field, they're all considered first responders, right? Um, but, you know, another example that you mentioned earlier was like sanitation workers. They're out there in the field, but so far the state's determination has been that they're not included, right? And so um, part of that uh, that I mentioned earlier is that the city is pushing um, to have as many city workers included in those broad categories um, as possible. And ultimately this, the decision is up to the state, um, but I understand that it's an iterative conversation. And so our goal is to have more and more city employees deemed eligible under those categories. So before I let you get out of here um, and, 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 and we, we hear from uh, work protection and then go to our panelists, uh, I, I know we have MTA and some other folks on as well, the, 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 some of the uh, leadership from, from the unions there. Um, but early on, um, they took a lead on uh, how they were going to address families with the loss, by virtue of the loss of, of, of their loved ones, whether it was through uh, uh, ex expansion, extension of, of, of healthcare benefits, uh, during the most critical time to the, the, the eligible dependents, uh, as well as um, uh, pension compensation. Uh, obviously, we had to do a resolution and, and, and kind of an LS from a city perspective and, and something that was tempor temporarily adapted, adopted. But how, how, uh, moving forward, how do we intend, how does the city intend to, to make these families whole? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, right, there, uh, we had some discussions about this in the spring. The city has adopted a policy where we extend uh, health coverage for the surviving families of employees who've uh, unfortunately passed away due to COVID-19. That's been in place um, since the spring of 2020. I have not heard any discussions about, you know, rolling that back, changing the benefit or, um, get, you know, sort of not getting rid of it. Um, so, you know, we expect that to be in place for the foreseeable future. Um, OLR, one of our other functions is, you know, we handle the administration of health benefits for city employees. So we handle those applications and um, make sure that um, uh, the families of employees in that situation um, remain covered under health insurance. So I think what we anticipate is that's going to remain in place indefinitely. So, and, and, and for pension purposes, I know that that's something that requires legislation, but what were we able to do in terms of <clears throat> making these families whole there? And what would, in, in comparison to, to uh, what we're seeing with the 9-11 compensation, uh, are we able to do for, for those who passed by virtue of COVID-19? Yeah, you're right that that's all subject to uh, to state statute. And I know that there have been proposals that were made last year. I haven't seen, um, you know, recently since the new session started, um, if if any of those have moved. But um, there were different proposals um, to um, uh, address COVID-19 situations as, um, you know, uh, to classify them as, you know, on, on the job or um, accidental um, deaths, because you know, those lead to different benefits um, on the pension side. But that, 
it's going to get worked out in Albany, as I understand. Is, is that something that the administration can support? Um, I, I think we'd have to look at a specific proposal um, and uh, and assess it. Um, so, it, you know, we can certainly have conversations offline. If there's a, a bill that's up in Albany, um, we can let you know our position on it. Okay. And and so now that I got you on that, now, because this is a, a broadly defined non um, COVID, uh, the labor force and its impact of COVID, uh, which we're going to have some folks that, that want to testify to furloughs and layoffs and stuff like that. Uh, what has been the impact and, and what are you seeing? Uh, is, and and as well, also, I, I think there's some folks that, that on uh, uh, NQ that would like to hear the, the administration's position on an early retirement as well. Sure. So um, taking those one at a time, right? We, you know, although um, we're facing enormous budgetary challenges, right? We haven't laid off any city employees. Um, and certainly from uh, our office's standpoint, from OLR standpoint, our goal is to, to not have to do that at all. Um, and so we've reached some accommodations with our labor unions um, to, um, in negotiations to defer certain payments or benefits, which would have been made in the current fiscal year, maybe you know uh, to next year, um, which has assisted on a short-term basis some of the city's budgetary challenges, and obviously, um, you know everyone's got their eye on Washington to see if there's going to be a federal stimulus package. And our hope is that with the appropriate support from federal and state authorities, um, that the city can weather this without laying any employees off. I can't make any guarantees, but it's certainly our preference to um, not have a single employee get laid off because every city employee performs important work for the city. Um, in terms of early retirement, um, uh, I do believe that the city, um, as a general concept, um, would support um, a targeted, specific um, early retirement package. And the, um, uh, the details, such as which titles would be eligible and how many employees would be eligible, is something that's going to have to work out, be worked out in the legislative negotiation process, much like the pension um, where they mm -hmm. would have a bill in Albany. Um, but um, I think as a general proposition, some uh, early retirement um, uh, provision uh, we think would be appropriate. Um, and it's, it's certainly preferential to a layoff because the employees in that situation are making the choice to retire as opposed to be being involuntarily separated. And, 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 and finally, for, for, for those representing the managerial association and, and workforce, and, and the furloughs that, that have taken place, were they negotiated and, and what, 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 what could they anticipate in the future? Um, so no, they were not uh, negotiated. That was a step that was taken um, for the employees who are not represented by labor unions, of which I am one. Um, and so the furlough days was meant to um, address some of those short-term short budgetary issues that I mentioned um, in the current fiscal year. And so um, those five days are supposed to go through the end of March, right, which is in a couple of months. Um, and I, I haven't been privy to any discussions about whether there's going to be anything um, coming along after that. But again, I think um, it, it applies to the managers as well. If we get appropriate support uh, in terms of a federal stimulus package and or the support we need from the state um, to address those budgetary issues, I think our goal is to not have to furlough workers. Layoffs and furloughs, right? Um, those are all sort of our, our last steps on the, on the list of things to do. So, um, you know, I think um, if we had our druthers, it would be the, the five days would end and that would be it. Okay, thank, thank you so very much. Uh, thank you for, for your testimony. Again, I hope that you can hang around. Um, can we hear from uh, uh, Worker Protection on, on rollout and what we're seeing on terms of support for, for the private sector and, and those industries uh, and access to the vaccine? Sure, so the Department of Health um, and, and uh, Mental Hygiene, particularly the Vaccine Command Center, is really um, the point in terms of managing uh, distribution um, and, and the sprawl of the vaccine um, in general in this city. So I may not, um, just to, um, to know with, I may not have uh, all the specifics to, to some of the questions that you may have, but I'm happy to take that back to my health department um, colleagues and, and get you answers to that. Um, that said, 
Um, I do know um, in terms of what uh, the Department of Health is doing uh, in the sense of they are currently and are actively engaging with agencies like the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, doing an agency needs and resource assessment, if you will. Um, the point of that um, is A, to obviously have an agency vaccination lead for each, for each agency, but also with the idea of uh, leveraging constituencies that we have, for example, and I'll speak to, to my agency, obviously, um, in terms of like folks that come through our licensing center, um, whether those folks are business owners or, or, or uh, expediters on behalf of, of various businesses that we license, getting a sense of what, um, what populations kind of come into our office on the day-to-day, -day, um, demographic breakdowns for those folks um, to the extent that we have that information. Um, and then um, obviously it's up to the health department ultimately to, to, to think of how best to utilize that. But the idea of this kind of assessment and surveying that's going on citywide um, by the Department of Health is to um, set up kind of an apparatus to uh, ensure that the vaccine goes out um, as, as quickly as possible um, and that we're leveraging our, our, our natural constituencies to, to do so. So um, while ultimately like final decisions haven't been made there, those kinds of background efforts are, are happening right now um, in terms of setting up uh, um, or I guess in terms of like information collection and, and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, we'll, you know, we'll take our leads from the Department of Health ultimately as to like what the best approaches are. Um, in terms of, you know, further planning and things like that, I think they're, they're probably best suited to, to answer those questions. Our visibility is really um, mostly focused on how we can um, best support the health department and, if need be, um, you know, set up services so that, uh, you know, folks can, can come in and maybe get vaccinated, you know, leveraging our, our contacts or things like that. Um, of course, um, with all that said, we also uh, amplify Department of Health's uh, uh, literature and information to, to all of our business contacts, our community-based uh, organizations, faith-based organizations, and other stakeholders we work with through you know, our, our email blast, through conversations, every kind of virtual town hall uh, that you can imagine that we have, it comes up in some capacity. And if we don't have a health department representative there, we're certainly giving folks uh, a touch point um, to ensure that they can follow up with the appropriate experts to, to get the latest information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, have, have, have you engaged any of the bargaining units representing some of the private sector workers? Uh, I, I, I know that uh, BJ's out there and, 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 and uh, uh, RCWU and, and folks like that in the retail, you know, what, what, what kind of conversations are going on between worker protection and, and, and those folks to ensure that their, their membership is, is, uh, has access to the vaccine? Yeah. Um, so any conversations that we're having with, with private sector unions regarding the vaccine are really um, just an amplification of, of the work that the health department is doing. That's really their expertise, their purview to ensure uh, that, that the most accurate information is going out to them. Our communications with the unions and where we have you know, the most expertise to work with them on is to give them um, in some cases guidance or, or collateral as to what New York State's workplace and health guidelines are. Um, whether that's you know the enforcement of our paid safe and sick leave laws or other uh, workplace laws that we enforce, or um, speaking to um, the guidelines that the state has has set as it relates to like self uh, uh, health and safety protocols in the office. In terms of vaccine distribution, that's really an effort that's being housed at the health department, and um, the expertise lies there. And of course, we you know, provide, provide soft referrals to our colleagues and, and, uh, and uh, uh, make sure that uh, if they have any questions, they're, they're getting their answers as, as quickly as possible. 
but um, uh, in terms of like specific guidance that would be best served from, from the health department. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephen. I, I actually put something in, the, in um, something in the chat room for you specifically. If you can get back to us, we we really appreciate that. And for the panel, we appreciate you. Um, I, I I do have uh, Steve. Uh, uh, if 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 I don't know if it's Steve or, or, or uh, Deputy Commissioner Peanut would would answer because it is a DCAS. It is about DCAS uh, return to work policy. And, and whether or not it is enforceable by, by all agencies or is it a general policy and, and, and uh, agencies kind of do what they want. I think Don's on mute. Oh, can I unmute? Okay, great. So I'll take that. Um, so as I mentioned before, that uh, the policies that we create really provide overarching guidance. And there is some level of latitude that an agency head can exercise in including those um, agency specific elements. In terms of an enforcement component of our policies, generally that's not um, how our policies are written. Um, certainly do we follow up with agencies um, similar to what Steve had mentioned earlier is that you know if we hear about any complaints if we hear about um, really a, a significant deviation from policy, we certainly follow up with those agencies and those responsible parties at those agencies directly. But if you're asking if there's a specific enforcement component of our pol policies as written, no, there is not. That, that answers the question. And uh, I wanna thank everyone on the panel uh, for your time. And, and obviously there's gonna be a plethora of follow-up questions and, and I hope that we can continue to work together as, as, as we have. Um, while I, you know, uh, because I, I, I know we have the, the director and president from uh, uh, CWA Local 1183. And uh, if, if some, I, I know that DCAS was out uh, last week in Queens uh, to the uh, uh, Board of Elections uh, uh, facility. And could you, could you, could you very briefly, uh, if you know what took place there or what response uh, DCAS and, and agencies had uh, very briefly? So I, I can take that one, um, mm -hmm. uh, Chair Miller. Um, so one, when we heard of uh, and report and the actual incident was reported, which was a positive case, one of the employees um, tested positive, we implemented the protocols that we normally have. So just for context, at the actual Queens location, there are multiple agencies there, including the Board of Election, Doris, as well as DCAS. So once we found out from a DCAS standpoint, and I think this is a little bit, this is kind of a little complex because DCAS as an agency, we actually had our staff present as well as we were also the ones who provided guidance on kind of, kind of how to deal with some of these situations. And so once we heard of it, we immediately talked to our staff. That employee um, contacted the HR representative. HR representative told the employees or the employees that were affected um, what they were to do. They advised them on their leave policies, any other information they needed to have. Then they were immediately, they contacted the facilities management division and the facilities management division actually dispatched um, uh, uh, facilities or custodial staff, building services staff to actually disinfect the entire facility. Now, the way that gets a little bit complex is that in addition to um, uh, cleaning and disinfecting what was naturally DCAS's primary space, which is our storehouse, we also were contacted by Doris and helped them out as well, as well as we were in touch with BOE. Um, with that, um, uh, we also did on-site testing. So we contacted our partners um, uh, to actually bring testing on-site day of um, and offered that to all employees. And so that's a little bit of a, syn a synopsis of what, kind of what transpired and the different communications that happened. When, when you say all employees, you mean DCAS employees or employees including Dora and the uh, Board of Election? So good question. So we actually, it was uh, offered to um, uh, DCAS employees as well as uh, Doris asked for their staff as well. We made contact to BOE. I am not sure, I'd have to get back to you on whether they actually um, uh, use what was on site or whether they instructed their employees to go to an offsite um, uh, testing facility. 
Well, they, they, they I, I was told that you guys did not make the offer to, to BOE employees and they, they did not actually test their employees till Monday, which is four days later, right? And, and which therein lies the dilemma and what we said, what happens when you have multiple agencies at one facility, is there a universal language that supports workers or do we see a situation that we see now? Um, just wanted to, to kind of put that out as 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 a you know point of clarification as to what can and should be done or what was done as opposed to what was not as we move forward. So I, I want to thank you for and I want to thank you for uh, your support and immediately addressing that as well as we we spoke last week and um, that is quite frankly the type of response that that uh, that the workforce really deserves. So I want to thank you and and the agency. And, and your leadership on that. And, um, but we do wanna kind of follow up on how do we bring greater access to some of the programming and technical support that DCAS provides for not just agencies, but for that, that kind of trickle down to the office level, how we best support those workers that are working from home and not just um, their experience, but how they better deliver services to, to the public, right? How do we better serve the public? Because we are not trained to work remotely. We, we, we're doing it out of passion, but you know that passion well is kind of run dry. Now we need some, some support to take it to the next level. And we're hoping that DCAS can do what it's done in the past and really provide that type of uh, support for the workforce as we move forward. So again, thank you. Um, thank you uh, to OLR. Uh, and, and, and worker protection for uh, uh, being here and, um, and really uh, looking forward to working with you. And so we have a long list of panelists that we're going to get to. And, and, and so once again, thanks everybody on the panel for coming out. And uh, I guess you can be expecting a, a list of questions that we can all work on to collectively to ensure that we're keeping workers safe and uh, in a very equitable way. Before we move on, I just wanted to update you. Uh, you had asked a question about the, the amount of time between a person going on at one of the city sites and getting an appointment. Yes. Uh, folks at the Vaccine Command Center said it's never been uh, that long. It's usually about a week out. So right now, employees can go and make appointments for next week at those five sites if they're in an eligible uh, function. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So so I and, and, and after we kind of aggregate the information, some of the folks work for agencies but not necessarily in the titles that that met the criteria. So, and then I, I, as you know, I, I will put that out as well. Um, okay, so thank you again and look forward to working with each and every one of you. Uh, before we call the next panel, I just wanna uh, uh, acknowledge that uh, council member, we've been joined by council member Farrell Lewis as well. And, and remind uh, all my colleagues uh, that please, uh, ask questions and uh, raise your hand so that we know that you're in queue. Um, and I did not see any hands up in which you, before we, uh, from uh, the council members or the committee members. So uh, they have been excused this panel. So we're going to now ask the host to call the next panel. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one more quick check. If there's any questions that the council members have for administration, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function, Zoom raise hand function, and keep any questions to five minutes. Seeing none from any other council members, we will now move to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the time limit. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first four panelists will be Vinnie Alvarez, Sean D. Francois I, Donald Nesbitt, and Ralph Palladino. I will now call on Vinnie Alvarez. You may begin once your name is called. Once the sergeant time starts time. now. Sorry, uh, morning, time starts now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, 
uh, members of the committee and to my colleagues as well. I hope everyone is staying safe and, and, and happy new year to everybody for those who I haven't seen. Uh, the New York City Central Labor Council is a, is a nonprofit member, membership organization devoted to supporting, advancing, and advocating uh, for working people in New York City as the, as the nation's largest labor federation of the, the New York City CLC brings together 300 unions uh, representing 1.3 million workers from every trade, occupation, public and private sector of the New York economy. Uh, New York City is in the midst of an unparalleled health and economic crisis and working people remain on the front lines of that crisis. Our healthcare workers, our first responders are caring for those who are ill. Our retail and distribution center workers are making sure that food and other supplies are available. Transportation, sanitation and construction workers have been on the job keeping New York City running so that we all have access to good job, to goods and services that we rely on. Over the past 10 months, we've seen with stark clarity that the very workers we too often take for granted are the ones who are the most essential to our safety, health, and well-being. At the same time, workers in other critical industries are facing unbearable economic hardship. Business closures and other COVID-related impacts have caused an unprecedented increase in job losses and unemployment. That impact has been felt, felt most acutely by women in communities of color who disproportionately work in some of the most heavily affected sectors. According to BLS data released earlier this month, employers cut 140,000 jobs nationally uh, in, in December with women accounting for all those job losses, losing 156,000 jobs while men gained 16,000. And a separate BLS survey showed that while black and Latino women lost jobs in that month, white women actually made gains meaning that it was women of color who carried the brunt of these losses. Here in New York City, among the hardest hit have been workers in hospitality industry and our arts and entertainment industry, two of the engines of New York City's economy. Before the pandemic, New York's hospitality industry provided as many as 400,000 jobs and contributed $46 billion in annual spending to New York City's economy. As of November, employment in New York, in the New York hospitality industry was at just 59% of pre-pandemic levels, and the arts and entertainment workers have been locked out of the economy since March of 2020, with theaters and other live entertainment venues not expected to reopen until the fall of this year. It is critical that we prioritize the protection of essential workers and the support of all workers through the pandemic. To that end, the labor movement is calling on all levels of government to respond with all of the resources at their disposal. The national level of partners at the AFL-CIO will call for Congress to enact the Workers' Focus First Agenda that will include actions to bring the COVID-19 pandemic under control, guaranteeing access for all workers to free vaccines and rapid testing, issue emergency- Time expired. Keep going. Issu issuing emergency COVID-19 standards from OSHA and, and MSHA and taking actions, which President Biden called for this week, taking actions to ensure an adequate supply of personal protective equipment and ensuring paid sick days, paid family leave and childcare. State level, uh, among other COVID related priorities, organized labor is calling for the enactment of the New York Heroes Act for improvements in paid sick leave available to all workers quarantining or isolating as a result of exposure and for essential workers who are at increased risk to be considered a priority for receiving vaccines once available. We also need to address specific issues related to unemployment insurance, related to COVID, including eligibility for benefits for workers who need to voluntarily separate from employment due to underlying conditions that put them at a higher risk of serious illness or health. And here in New York City, we just we need to, our elected officials to continue to use every tool at your disposal to support the economic security as well as the health and safety of New York City's workforce. We need you to continue to work with New York City's unions whose members' lives and livelihoods are online to create targeted policy solutions that ensure our economic recovery without putting our workers at risk. We need to identify ways to increase revenue, maintain critical public services, and invest in our city's infrastructure to kickstart the rebuilding of our city's economy over the coming months and years. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic has renewed the need for strong protections for workers against retaliation and exploitation and the need for all local officials to prioritize those protections, fighting for all workers to have a voice on the job, fair treatment, and due process. We have a long road ahead, and the decisions we make over the next few months will have an enormous impact on the future of our city, our workforce, and our communities. City, the CLC continues to look forward to working with our partners and city government to fight for our city's economic recovery, for the health and safety of all working people. And I thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. And please do not hesitate to reach out to us 
at the CLC if we could be of any assistance. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, President Alvarez. Uh, and 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 you know, normally we we, we kind of save questions for the end, but I I would like to ask: Is is there a specific committee, uh, subcommittee at the CLC that is working on COVID related issues? And and what role can the council and sp more specifically the Committee on Civil Service and Labor play? And we we want to be a part of that if in fact that does exist. Well, Mr. Chair, because of the, the widespread nature of the, of the issues affecting uh, the COVID-19 and the pandemic and the economic consequences as a result, every sector of our economy right now is, has been impacted and every sector of the labor movement is involved. So we're working closely, of course, with our affiliates and our delegates, our executive board are involved um, and, and our political directors to the extent that we need to take uh, political action on legislative and meet uh, and come up with legislative uh, remedies to some of these problems. So we're really all involved uh, and, and many of these unions have specific safety and health committees set up that are that have now been kicked into high gear for the past 10 months. Um, and so it's been all hands on deck and, and I expect it to be that way uh, throughout the remainder of this pandemic. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank I'm you. now calling Sean D. Francois the first. Time starts now. Uh, Chairman Adelik Miller and distinguished members of the Committee of Civil Service and Labor. I am President Sean D. Francois I, and it's an honor to testify on behalf of approximately 24,000 members represented by Local 372, the New York City Board of Education employees, District Council 37 ASME. The COVID-19 pandemic has crystallized the social economic disparities of Local 272. About 43% of the union membership are essential workers namely school lunch employees and school crossing guards who are deemed essential workers by the Department of Education and NYPD. They are risked their own health as they remain on the front lines throughout even the worst of the pandemic local 72 members have worked. As much of the city shut down, safely sheltered in their homes. Our job categories are the lowest paid, paid sometimes as little as the state minimum wage of $15 per hour. Additionally, many of our members are at higher risk because they are older with 30% of the membership over 55. Our workforce is predominantly Black and Latino at 85% and living working on zip codes with the highest COVID rates much higher than other communities. Our school lunch workers continue to unload, prepare, and food and serve each day without necessary PPEs and to ensure safety as they serve meals to food and secure members in the community. Before the city stepped up to the program of the frontline workers, we said with two of the leadership that self-purchased and sought masks for its members. It was then local 72 titles that risked infection when there were no provisions in place or proper training of custodians on the safe utilization of electrostatic, electrostatic spr sprayers and the safe handling of chemicals to sanitize the schools. Now, school crossing guards were mandated to work with no children had on their screen, on the street. They were told that if they didn't come to work, they would not get paid. They put their health and lives at risk to remain on the job when classrooms were empty to ensure pedestrian safe access to city schools for grab and grow programs. Our members had to communicate procedures for safe caution instructed by Centers for Disease Control guidelines to help prevent the transmission of COVID-19. To say the least, six foot apart from other individuals and using safe sidewalk, sidewalk adequate. Now, while I'm hopeful that the new Biden administration Immediate focus on COVID-19 will help bring the pandemic under control. Hope is no reason to let our guard down. Local 272 members cannot be left behind and a state and city administer vaccinations to the most vulnerable at risk and essential populations. Our members need to access the assistance, benefits and protections to help them continue to work safely during this emergency state. This includes meaningful sick, leave unemployment benefits and hazard pay. In addition, the pandemic exposure to related challenges we must also face is mental health affecting students, according to the I'm recent inspired. report. Keep going, keep going. Okay. The report concluded that it's critical to monitor children's mental health, promote coping and resilience, and expand access to services to support children in their mental health. Now, the substance abuse prevention and intervention specialist, SAPIS, represented by Local 72, which provides essential social emotional strategies and services to help youth remain learning, 
are best equipped to shoulder this responsibility. Since 1971, the Cypress program has provided evidence-based programs to, to presentations of groups and individuals and counseling. And positive alternatives to New York City public school students, Cypress Council service K-12 in all 32 districts in New York City, including education. Now, however, the New York City Department of Education not currently prioritizing assistance Cypress access to meet the COVID enhanced demand for more social emotional learning the May the module, First Lady McRae and Chancellor Carranza recently announced a new 2021 organization to duplicate the program and status already provides. The future the education provides for a child is one of the most obligations society must fulfill. And that while tens of thousands of local children members continue to face the threats, exposure, and affection to show up to work each and every day. I thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Local 272. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, President DeFrancois. And we, we will, after the panel, we do have a few questions after everyone goes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll call on Donald Nesbitt. Time starts now. Oh, actually, I spoke, for, I spoke for Donald Nesbitt as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll call on Ralph Palladino. Time starts now. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Local 1549 and President Eddie Rodriguez. Um, I have uh, written or uh, put together nine pages of testimony, which was submitted to the committee, will be sent to city council people, which they should look at. Um, part of it is an analysis. The other part is uh, people who are experts, who, namely our members working in various agencies and hospitals, 311, 911, uh, and other, and HRA, dealing with issues of health and safety and the workflow as it reflects um, the delivery of services in the city, because we do not link, uh, we just do not talk about our own health and safety. We talk about self and safety and also the relationship to delivering services to people in need and also uh, articles which were written by those same people about the type of work they do because they are all first responders. Um, the uh, issue of safety and health, um, the, in every agency that we've had to have meetings, uh, people have listened to us. In the beginning, there was a shortage of, sta there was a shortage of masks and our locals, like other locals and unions, put together masks and got them out to members. Uh, but since then, the PPE has been, uh, and, and management, generally speaking, in dealing with different issues has been very uh, forthcoming and assisted. There are some issues dealing, um, a vaccine, by the way, is um, available. Uh, however, and we, we get reports from hospitals in 911 that they haven't been able to get the vaccines in the last week because there was, it ran out. So hopefully today, from what I hear, uh, this is going to be alleviated. Um, the uh, situation, I, I believe, is which I don't uh, get answers to, is the issue of ventilations in the older buildings. The ventilations ne issue needs to be dealt with. So as someone who works in hospitals, I know this. So uh, that has to be paid attention to, and I want to hear more about how that's being dealt with. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the uh, other issues dealing with um, cooperation, I have to say that hospitals has been tremendously cooperative. Our members are frontline people that see the first ones to see patients, uh, all in, and in the ICUs and in the emergency room, et cetera, uh, and testing and also vaccines. Um, we have issues with, um, and you know, we're civil service people, and we have issues with the city on how they're dealing with our titles and civil service. Also, the question of interpreters, which you saw in the newspaper, that's delivery of service to people who need it the most. Communication is key and critical. Um, and um, the last thing I want to bring up is the staffing shortages. People talk about uh, early retirement and layoffs. It is ridiculous that they have layoffs, or to even talk about it. Early retirement should be done only if there is going to be layoffs. We are short staffed in 911, 311 hospitals. Time expired. And in, hey, Ralph. And in, 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 in HRA with eligibility specialists. We have been fighting the issue in HRA around eligibility specialists for four years. And this, the administration in HRA, the administration at City Hall, and DCAS does not want to listen. 
this manager report just came out from, from the mayor. The application timeliness for SNAP it is at, was at 93% last year, 74% this year. HRA, for the first time, has not issued error reports. And I would guess that the reason they don't want to issue error reports is because of the fiasco going on in HRA. And that includes health and safety issues with clients coming in. And we have reports and we've been dealing with in HASA and also a couple of agencies, where, uh, areas where people are coming in crowded and unmasked. Um, in 911, we don't have that issue because in 311, but everyone's closed in and we can't do anything about that, but they are working with us. But the clients coming into these areas, uh, there has to be some kind of organization and education going on there. The last thing is that when we're dealing with finances for the city, we all have to go to Albany. We all should be up there demanding revenues, not cuts. And we have to say it loudly. And quite frankly, I love the city council people, but I want to hear more from the city council on that. And, and we also should be up in Albany dealing with these issues, including the HEROES Act together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. I'll turn it back over to Chair Miller if he has any questions. Uh, yeah. Um, no, no, we're good. Uh, pre pre President uh, DeFrancois, uh, you, you mentioned equity. Uh, had, had, had your membership been able to access vaccines? I, and, and I was watching some of the stuff that you had put out and posted and, 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 and kind of the response, but uh, are they 1A and have they been able to receive vaccines where, where, where applicable? Well, yeah, yeah, they are able to receive it, but at the time it, it just seems that the limitation in the, um, the outreach to the, the, the particular uh, areas to get it at is very difficult for some of the members. Okay. Um, sometimes the members of the, of the um, also the scheduling and got to, got to work. Some employees don't allow them to leave. You know, so some, I mean, I know I heard that they're supposed to get three hours, but all this stuff is just what is sort of on paper. But in the real world, some of these don't happen. They have a lot of difficulties trying to obtain scheduling, different different aspects of the um, five boroughs to achieve these vaccinations. Right, also, right, right. because they're saying it's it's uh, too much people here at one time, and they turned away, and it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of wow. things that need to be. I know there's a lot of moving parts, but a lot of things need to be addressed as well. Okay, so so long. Listen, we need to hear from you guys, and, and so it has to go on paper. Uh, anything that we can continue to do to support uh, this workforce, your membership, or cr clearly they are critical. That but they have been often marginalized, and we want to make sure that uh, the benefits of, uh, of the vaccine are distributed equitably and, and, and we want to be that, that vehicle to ensure that happens. So uh, beyond the, you know, the grievances and, and, and that process, uh, but make sure that, that we are a part of it as well. We also want to, I don't know if DCAS is, is still on, uh, to address brick and mortars, uh, to make sure that, that you know, the management of these facilities are consistent with with, uh, with with the guidelines. Uh, uh, that is a big part of it too. We, we we look at you know the workers and you know, but in order for us to, to return to work in these uh, uh, buildings, we have to make sure that the buildings are, are, are safe and that they're meeting very specific guidelines as well. So any input that you guys have on that, that we'd be willing to receive it and and willing to work with you uh, collaboratively to ensure that these things are occurring. Uh, and I wanna thank you all. Is, is there, let me see in the, I'm sorry, trying to look in the raised hand and uh, see if any of my colleagues uh, have any questions for this panel. If not, uh, can we move forward to the next panel? I wanna thank you all for, for your testimony and look forward to working with each and every one of you. Uh, and this is uh, an important hearing. I'm glad that everyone took the time to be here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving to the next panel, uh, I will be calling on the following panelists, Oren Barzai, Josh Kellerman, Anthony Wells, and Mark Henry. We will now call on Oren Barzai. Time starts now.
Chairperson Miller, and all members of the Labor Committee. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today from the perspective of the FDNY EMS, which we believe is the Uniform First Responders Work Group most impacted by answering tens of thousands of emergency calls due to the coronavirus pandemic. I am Warren Barzillay, president of FDNY EMS Local 2507. I also want to say that both Local 3621 and the FDNY EMS Superior Officers Association, although could not be here today, wish to express their appreciation for the work of this committee and the focus of today's hearing. First, I would like to recognize and thank our city's dedicated, hardworking, and undercompensated EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors who bravely risk it all. Their health, their families, their families' health to help tend to the urgent medical needs of New Yorkers during this extremely difficult period. This job has gotten increasingly dangerous. Each and every day, one of our members has stepped up to the plate to serve and protect this city in its dire time of need. We know the immediate dangers that the increased risk our members have contracting COVID-19, but I want to talk to you about the additional risk, which is our members' livelihood. It is no secret that the city is being put under immense financial distress due to the circumstances that these last 10 months have placed us on. We have seen businesses shut down, our city in lockdown, as well as rising unemployment rates. The city's blueprint for getting back on its feet to lay off 22,000 municipal workers, including EMS first responders, seems regressive. We, we must remember that these are the same responders who at the height of this pandemic worked so tirelessly, responding to over 7,000 calls a day Medical, medical calls a day to ensure the safety of our city, of our city residents before their own safety and well-being. They work 16 to 18 hour shifts to make up for a shortage of EMS staff. They slept in cars for days and weeks at a time to put food on the table, but not to go home for fear of contaminating their own loved ones. If you ask me, outsourcing our jobs or facets of it should and must be off the table. Our workforce, consisting mostly of women and minorities, manage 80% of all emergency calls at the FDNY. In the height of the pandemic, EMS managed 100% of emergency medical calls, all while our members were paid 40% less than their uniform peers. Contrast that disparity to the city of Boston where EMS workforce makes only 2% less than police and firefighters, the double standard here in New York City is beyond compare. Here in the Big Apple, the highly trained medical professionals, yes, medical professionals of the FDNY EMS are told we are only worth $16 an hour. It's shameful. Council members, the EMS is the revenue generating side of the FDNY. The FDNY charges people's health insurance or Medicare or Medicaid for ambulance trips taken and for providing medical treatment such as drug administration, oxygen, intravenous and other treatments. In fact, the multi-millions in fees paid to the city for our work flows back into the Office of Management and Budget. Yet some believe is cutting that some believe that cutting that revenue flow and outsourcing that income instead to some private ambulance companies or hospitals to be beneficiary of. Since our city is getting reimbursed for a large percentage of our work product, what's the real cost of our labor to the city? Is it four or six dollars per hour, perhaps? Does the city believe it can outsource our jobs to China or India and pay even less? Is there some private sector ambulance service here in New York City out there paying even less than the city of New York does to our members? The life-saving services provided by medical professionals of the FDNYs is a win-win for the city and most especially for its bean counters on both ends of the financial ledger. 
Today, we should instead be talking about equity for those men and women doing Herculean work for pauper's wages. The coronavirus has overwhelmed the entire New York City healthcare system, from hospitals to nursing homes, putting immeasurable stress also on the FDNY EMS workforce. Right now, with insufficient resources, yes, the city is referring calls to outside ambulance services, and they, put, and they become the beneficiaries of medical reimbursement and not the city treasury. Our city's uniform staff are more than capable of handling day-to-day -day operations of caring for the needs of our fellow New Yorkers without contract outsourcing. But we need the support of City Hall to provide the integrity of our jobs and its critical role in protecting lives. Our members need more stable work-life balance with compensation more com commensurate with other medical professionals and perhaps in similar proportion to our peers in Boston EMS, paid almost the same as police and fire in their city, so that our members don't need to moonlight with two or three jobs just to survive. As of today, there's no mention or discussion for hazardous pay for EMS or any other essential workers. I thank you for your time and I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Josh Kellerman. Time starts now. Hello, everybody. Chair Miller, members of the committee, thank you. There we go. Hi, can you hear me now? All right, it looks like it's working. Hello, my name is Josh Kellerman. Um, I work at, I'm the Director of Public Policy at RWDSU, the Retail Workers Union. Um, thank you, Chair Miller and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak. We represent approximately 40,000 workers in New York City, members in retail, grocery stores, pharmacies, food service, food processing, car washes, nursing homes, airlines, nonprofit social service organizations, and more. Um, I can't overstate the impact of COVID-19 on our members. Um, we've had over 40 members uh, lose their lives as a result of COVID. Um, it has resulted in workers in the grocery store industry, many of whom earn the minimum wage, fearing for their lives every day they show up to this essential job. And it has caused untold misery in the poultry and meatpacking industries, as many of you have heard. It's also put enormous strain on our healthcare members. On the other side, we have members in the non-essential industries like apparel retail, who have had their own uh, uh, degree of suffering from COVID-19. Uh, many of these workers also earn low wages and had little financial cushion prior to the crisis, and then many were furloughed, fired, uh, and now are being brought back uh, into an uncertain industry in brick and mortar retail where the work is largely part time. Um, we've coordinated funding drives and food drives, educational events, um, and, uh, and a lot of work trying to ensure that uh, these workers have adequate uh, testing, PPE, paid sick leave. Uh, UI, workers comp, et cetera. Um, our experience in New York is that a clear plan with enforceable standards is the right way to go. Um, so to Occam's razor, the simplest solution is, is the right one. No mask, no service has been very simple for us to enforce with our employers. I know it's uh, obviously more complicated in the non-union sector, but um, even before we had a statewide standard on no mask, no service, um, we were able to have that uh, negotiated in, in our union workplaces across the city. Um, and that's because we have workplace democracy at union shops. So it's moments like this during pandemics, that the value of unions comes into sharp relief. Um, I'll note that recently the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with their 2020 data on unemployment. And interestingly, they separate the data from union members from the overall working population. And what the data showed is that while jobs were lost at an alarming rate in 2020 in New York and across the country, proportionately, there were many fewer job losses at union shops. Um, so what we know is that unions not only protect workers' health and safety on the job, but also protect your job. And that's come uh, really into sharp contrast during the pandemic. Um, we've been fighting to ensure that our members working on the front lines, um, especially grocery store workers and healthcare workers are vaccinated. We've experienced some recent problems with the vaccination program. Um, I'm that, um, I'll finish briefly um, in that workers um, can't find appointments to be vaccinated. Um, 
And because they're working, they can't spend hours refreshing the website in the hope of openings uh, for, for accessing vaccinations. And so we're still not quite sure of the solution here. We've been <laughs> doing our best to support these workers, but it, it's, uh, it's a real problem for uh, working people right now is there, they just can't spend hours on the internet trying to figure this out. Um, I'd like to say, thank the chair and the committee members for uh, at the last hearing on this advancing the uh, Healthy Terminals Act resolution, which encouraged the governor to sign the Healthy Terminals Act to the state. Uh, subsequently, the governor signed that bill, um, which will uh, ensure access to health insurance for thousands of airline workers uh, across the city, which is just so essential right now. Uh, so I just wanted to conclude by saying now more than ever, we need bold ideas to protect workers and build back better. We look forward to working with you and your committee to do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, I will call on Anthony Wells. Uh, good afternoon. Thank Time you, starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and council members uh, for this opportunity. Um, I want to touch on two weeks. Two, first of all, we support ERI. Obviously, when it's supply, you must look at uh, the needs of the agency. But um, the ERI uh, program, early retirement incentive, uh, will save jobs, uh, not just in the immediate, but going on to the future. And obviously, where there are shortages, we need to look at that. Okay. Uh, also, we have, um, it's a really outrageous that workers who work in centers, job centers, some of the welfare centers and the centers, they have to go through a screening where a client can come in and nothing's done. There's no screening, there's no, there's no temperature reading. And when we tell them they, we should not be seeing clients who do, refuse to wear masks, the state says they can't do that. Well, that's, that's, that's a total contradiction, just total contradiction. So I, I, I instruct my, my members to, uh, to, if the client's not wearing masks, we're not gonna see them. We're not gonna interview them. We are not gonna put our families at risk because, uh, because and it's interesting that Josh said that in, in, in the private sector, and <laughs> he's able to negotiate something that says they, they will not service people who come into their stores without masks. By the way, Josh, great work in Alabama. My brother-in-law my brother -in -law is Alan Gummy. He's working on that. Alan Gregory, great job. Because everything's been said already. In terms of, of working with DCAS and OLR Law Commissioner Champion and Steve, it's been a good relationship. There are some rogue commissioners, like example in DOC, Department of Corrections, okay, who try to implement on um, return to work policies without a true discussion. So this council needs to look at that. They have true negotiations, true discussions. When all of a sudden you're saying, you're doing remote and then all of a sudden the remote is gone and everybody's coming back to work uh, and not have real discussions. That's, that, that's what I would like to see the council look into. We represent over 22,000 city employees in every agency in the city of New York, including DA's office and Wills. These workers have been working for the last 10 months. And yes, it, and, and my brother Aaron, uh, his workers have been at risk on the front lines but there are central workers that are also on front lines that you don't see. And that's those workers who have kept the city going, say city services going. Uh, people who, who need to depend on the city for subsistence and support, they have been kept going in the hospitals. So we need to look at, at, at this prioritizing as who is having contact with, with, with the public. And yes, sanitation workers have contact with the public and should be prioritized as all workers who, who do it. And then you and, and, and you ask about for people sneaking in, of course they are. There's no total check, there's no check on, or once you say you're working this, there's no really check on it. And so that has to be short of I'm inspired. because I'm on, and I'm, I am done beyond, I, I, I councilwoman uh, 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 <laughs> Adams, you know, hey listen, th this is real work. Thank you. It's not easy, but you gotta have people who are in touch with the public on so many levels to be part of the priority. And the city has done a good job, but it can do better. Thank you for this opportunity. Let's stay in this together. This is how we beat this, this pandemic. Thank you, Council uh, Chair, appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Mark Henry. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Chairman Miller and all the council uh, members that are there, the president and those on this Zoom call. My name is Mark Henry president and business agent for 1056. And the ATU, we appreciate this opportunity to emphasize the special plight of our transit workers and 
frontline people that have been dealing with COVID since its uh, inception back in March. Uh, all the ATUs uh, that are represented in, the, in New York City Transit uh, are all suffering uh, still uh, through the result of, of uh, some poor management by the New York City Transit Authority uh, to complicate those matters. Uh, we're working under expiring, have it, uh, expired contracts uh, with the threat of layoffs on top of that. Uh, the MTA has settled contracts with the uh, larger local uh, in the MTA, the TWU, but as far as the ATUs are concerned, that has not occurred and, and it's forcing us through the legislative process, which I think is a shame in regards to what has happened to our members. We've lost 33 members due to this virus. Uh, they have been functioning without a contract since May uh, with no relief in sight. We have seen, like I've seen, like I've stated, we have seen our members perish. We have seen our members get sick. We have seen family members of those members get sick. And it's all been a great toll uh, mentally on our membership as a whole. Uh, they've been doing their job, our membership, and you know, members of the TLU, of course, have been doing their job despite everything that has been going on. You know, transit workers, and it was stated by Brother Francois, can't shelter in place. Yet an agency that has some 33 floors was able to shelter in place while their transit workforce was out there uh, battling with this virus under the physical and the mental conditions and, and not being able to be compensated. You know, we were had hard pressed to get PPE for our members. We are now hard pressed to get the vaccine rolled out to our members. We are hard pressed to get uh, a contract for our members so that they are paid correctly and 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 fairly. Uh, we're doing a, a, a excuse me a fair day's work for fair day's pay, but yet we are being treated like second class citizens. Um, like I said, the, the the PPE issues still exist. We have gotten our PPE from our, our agency, but it's it's still not enough to satisfy our membership. Uh, we are still being assaulted in, in, in regards to what's going on on the buses and, and, and the subway system. There's a mass policy in place, but that doesn't stop the spread of this virus. Some of our members have been contracting this virus while at work, as well as at home. But those issues still exist. We, we, don't, we don't have the proper uh, enforcement out there. You know, if an individual gets on a, a bus without a mask, time expired. It's not something that can be readily uh, communicated to the agency that this individual needs to be removed. And that puts our members in jeopardy. Um, funding, uh, we know is needed. Our international has been working with the funding. We know that the Transit Authority has is, will receive $4 billion in funding from the federal government, but there has to be other streams of money to make sure that services are not cut. Public transit is a integral part of this, this city and without it, it's gonna die. So uh, these things are, are impacting our members greatly. It impacts the communities that the council member and the other members of the council serve and it needs to be addressed. Uh, and we're hoping that, you know, these things do come to fruition. I, I just testified in, a, in another case about the stock transfer tax and, and other forms of, of uh, funding. Uh, these things have to be talked about, have to be brought forward and, and needs to be uh, communicated correctly to the, to, to the public. Uh, again, I appreciate the councilman for ha holding this meeting uh, and this hearing. Um, I'm always here to help the council member and any other member of the council. If you need me as a resource to offer any advice or guidance, please reach out to my office. I have plenty of information I can divulge to you in regards to how things are going for our brothers and sisters in the transit authority. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. Now I'll turn it over to Chair Miller for any questions. Okay, uh, I, I just, for, for, for Orlin, I, I, Orlin, I, I know we have, uh, uh, we are waiting to vote out uh, intro 1731 which addresses hiring practices of, of uh, FDNY as it relates to EMS, how they disingenuously um, identify the, their workforce. When the majority of the folks leave to get promoted to go to firefighter, which you shouldn't have to do. 
to 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 earn enough to to feed your family when you have a profession that you have uh, committed to, trained for, and but you can't stay there because there's not enough dollars. But when a significant number of the workforce leave there to uh, get take a promotion, um, they do not include that in the numbers, right? Uh, of right. folks who who are, who are actually leaving the job. And so we want real transparency about the workforce, the hiring, and what that looks like. And, and so we would ask, and I, I would again uh, be calling on uh, Chair Borelli of Fire and Safety to make sure that we hear this, that this bill is voted upon and that um, we can change those practices. Because uh, we, we've been talking about this for a number of years, and had this been in effect, perhaps you'd have the number of workforce to support you uh, during COVID-19 and you'd have the membership and we wouldn't be talking about outside uh, workers coming in to, to do the work uh, that you guys do so well. So uh, on that, that is it. Um, I, I would also, uh, in terms of, uh, there was a question uh, about private sector access, but, um, uh, I'll just send that on to RCW and, and the others. And uh, are there any grievances that are ongoing COVID related that any of the panel have? I take that as no. We, we have uh, the labor department just yesterday contacted us that they're going to investigate the uh, numerous deaths that happened to our members at the FDNY. Okay, and and, and, and and chairman, we have uh -huh. we have a couple of uh, OSHA complaints uh, and juvenile justice uh, at, at the at the facilities. And you know, somebody said something earlier, if I, if I may. Somebody said something earlier about the the conditions of ventilation in these old in these older buildings. That's an issue going forward, and it's an issue now where people are occupied. But so we we had we've had had to make OSHA complaints, yes, and NICOSH complaints. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, so our complaint is with PESH as well, the yes. public employee safety and health. And 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 just as a point of clarity, you 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 mentioned in your statement that initially, a hundred percent of the of 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 the calls, COVID related, respiratory related calls, were being addressed by EMS. What exactly That's does that mean? That's correct. Uh, not, well, not, FDMY, not, don't they traditionally answer? So uh, when, as well. so so during the height, the, the peak of the incidents, and when the city realized that this was uh, extremely contagious, they pushed everybody back. Uh, police and firefighters had to stand down, basically allow EMS to go in and assess the situation. Uh, the only time that firefighters were told to go in is uh, when somebody wasn't breathing was to assist so only on the priority one calls. Okay. Otherwise, they were told to stand down. Everybody else yeah, in the 911 system, when it came to medical calls, EMS was the only one, the first one in and the last one's out. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, we will be working with your, all of you in the future. Um, if you have any questions, uh, there's something in the chat room, the committee put something in the chat room send those future questions or concerns uh, to the committee and we will definitely address them to the appropriate folk and look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you so much for, for participating in today's uh, hearing. We got a lot of work to do, we all know that. And I, I, am, I am certainly um, confident that that work will happen. So thank you. Uh, thank any you. my colleagues, uh, Benny, thank you so very much for your leadership, absolutely. We're going to call the next panel. Yes, moving to the next panel, uh, I will be calling on Alice Wong, Danny Casella, Donna G. Ellaby, and Gabriel Gallucci. We will now hear from Alice Wong. Time starts now. You may begin. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alice Wong. I am the executive director for the New York City Manager Employees Association. 
Thank you, Chair Miller, for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the 16,000 New York City manager employees and MEA members. These city employees are largely composed of women and minority groups, representing the diversity of New York City. During the height of COVID-19, many of our manager employees worked in areas outside of their job description without the option for overtime pay nor the ability to work from home. At ASC, case supervisors reported on site to provide central services that ensure the safety of our children and families. Their work proceeded regardless of the fact that PPE was not available between March and May for usage during their site visits. NEA advocated to make sure the voices of our members and frontline workers were heard. When PPE equipment became available, instruction and usage protocol was provided. AC as commissioner was responsive and proactive with communication announcements and updates regarding COVID-19. This was an example of leadership and concern for ACS staff members. H and H employees were not as fortunate. Employees at the manager level worked outside their job description and scope of duties, did not have the option to work from home nor to decline yeah. assigned tasks. These non-pedicure managers were told to write up employees who wanted to wear face masks and were often mocked. Managers were recruited to provide support services and troubleshoot for the hospital in areas such as facilities and engineering. Employees who tested positive were told to report to work instead of staying home to quarantine. Employees requested for infection control inspections and they still have not been made to date. Non-clinical managers are expected to bridge the staffing gap, yet they are not treated as essential workers who qualify for the vaccine in the first round. As MEA continues to advocate for H&H &H managers, we ask for open communication, clear safety guidelines, and consistent updates to COVID-19. MEA was asked to conduct a survey of its members on the response to COVID-19 with a focus on the city's communication, training protocol, and safety procedures. MEA will provide the results of the survey to the committee for review in the coming weeks. MEA is committed to providing advocacy for all city managers, and we thank Chair Miller for the opportunity to testify on the impact of COVID-19 on behalf of the 16,000 New York City manager employees. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Danny Casella. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Miller and uh, the rest of the committee. I'm Danny Casella, president of ATU 726. I proudly represent bus operators and maintenance personnel who work for the MTA on Staten Island. Behind me, you see a picture. That was one of my members that passed away at 46 years old from the COVID and um, many, many other members uh, sick. Um, we're getting a huge spike right now with, with uh, our members. Uh, Mark Hen Henry mentioned about 33 members uh, from the ETU passing away, but there's over 130 members that passed away that work for the MTA, you know, obviously including TW where um, they took the biggest hit, um, but it, it's still happening. One of my members yesterday, unfortunately, uh, uh, notified us that um, he contracted the COVID last week, brought it home to his wife and brought it home to his 10 year old son and uh, his 10 year old son passed away yesterday. So it's a, a horror and something that we have to live with and it's, it's just terrible. And I, I, Mark Henry really mentioned uh, all the points that I was gonna mention, but I just wanna know how many people here, like the transit authority is doing to us they're packing the buses. There's no protocol. They say there's no way of self-distancing. All you hear from the from the president now is you have to uh, stay away from people, wear masks. There's no enforcement on MTA bus. There's no enforcement on the train. If you want to wear it, you wear it. You don't want to wear it, you don't wear it. Our, our members are sitting ducks. They, 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 people are coming on there. We're fighting with the customers because they're arguing how many people you're going to allow on this bus. They're standing over us. They're coughing on us. You know, it, something has to be done. And and as far as I'm concerned, there's no regard for the membership whatsoever. And and if it wasn't for the union, things would be a hundred times worse. So I know I have more time, but I'm just disgusted. And I'm. That's it. 
turn it back over to you, uh, Chairman Miller. Thank you, President Casella. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll move and hear from Donna G. Ellaby. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Miller and members of the council and all of my fellow labor leaders for all of your dedicated work. Um, I did submit testimony. I hope that circulated among everyone. Uh, I just want to focus on some DCAS comments uh, about my membership. I am president of local CWA 1183. We represent the Board of Elections. Uh, a very maligned and underpaid staff. And at our Queens facility, when DCAS had a, a staff person test positive, they were able to uh, get a, a remote van out there the next day to test everyone. They did not extend that testing to our staff. And since then, five of our members have tested positive. Um, we have an election going on in Queens. Um, so uh, our folks are out in the world uh, and that often happens with elections. While we're essential workers, we transmute into frontline workers during the height of election season, which is coming up with other elections, special elections going on and petitions. Um, we are overcrowded in our offices. We've put in requests to DCAS, uh, which I think have kicked our requests to OMB since 2016 for additional office space to meet the changing needs of the electorate of the city of New York, which uh, in order to be a 21st century modernized agency, we need to have the space to perform the various functions that are required of us. Um, compared to my fellow labor leaders, we've only lost four members to COVID, but those four members are certainly sorely missed. And we've had over a hundred members and their family members test positive. And we've got among, among us a number of long haulers whose future life expectancy is really dim. Um, we've got a, a progressive mayor in this city, but he has not made the commitment that we need to ensure that our workforce gets what they deserve, both in terms of wages and in terms of protections. Uh, I think that because we are frontline workers, we need mobile vans to go to our facilities on a weekly basis and test our members. Uh, and so I'm hoping that out of this committee, we can advocate Time expired. for that need. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel and I'll turn it back over to Chair Miller for any questions. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, yeah, there, there are, uh, so Donna, uh, what you didn't mention is, is the amount of hours that your workforce puts in during these election cycles and, and, and the time that you're spending in this facility um, during the cycle, current cycle. Uh, one of the things um, they were in talking to DCAS, they, they're talking about the brick and mortars, how many people are out and what uh, that diminished workforce is gonna look like in terms of the, the city leasing of, of, of property and so forth. Um, and and we, get, we do recognize that um, the number of people actually going into to, to these facilities and working have diminished, but there are industries like what we're hearing today in transportation uh, in, in, at the Board of Elections where depending on people being there on the job, how do we ensure that we, we, we're mitigating uh, the, the possible infection that exists where, where we have such overcrowding there and, and, and raise that voice. And, 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 and clearly, you know, uh, there is enough uh, space that the city's currently leasing not being used that could translate. Are you having those kind of conversations? What does that no. mean from, from, yeah. 
And no, there, there's been there's been no response. Our requests have gone to OMB, at least that's my understanding, and it just enters a black hole. And um, as I said in my testimony, you know, uh, the electorate of the city of New York is entitled to have their franchise expanded to choice, whether it be absentee voting or early voting. And yet we do not have the space to accommodate staff to conduct these, proced these procedures in a way that supports the electorate without risking our lives. So, you know, um, and both from from a, a, a health and safety standpoint, as well as a fire safety standpoint. Did, did you also did did, did, did uh, your members or the BOE uh, did did a outbreak occur uh, in the Bronx uh, in, in yes. last month month before? And then what yeah. best practices, if any, have been adopted? Because clearly based on the response of, of DCAS and, and do with the other agencies that were in the building, they responded differently. What then did they learn, if anything, in terms of best practices that could have been applied here that would have prevented the same thing that happened last month from occurring again now? Um, I, I don't think that there was any consideration on the part of DCAS regarding best practices, but I must credit our management team of implementing staggered shifts because we cannot social distance. We sit two feet apart. And while we do have masks and we do have plexiglass, the plexiglass can't even provide the level of support or, or protection that does exist in other agencies because our office equipment doesn't allow the plexiglass to be extended. So, um, you know, we, we have done staggered shifts, but when it comes to really moving forward with an election, we have to be there. Okay, thank you. And and and, and for, for President Casella and, and, and Henry, uh, I know that my office and my colleagues are receiving tons of calls about trains and buses being overcrowded. Is that the type of advocacy that, that should come from, from us? And it cl clearly, you know, you guys are making that argument on a daily basis, um, and 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 in fact should be uh, filing grievances on on low guidelines. Um, do, in, in fact, on that issue, um, have go low guidelines changed during COVID nineteen, or do they remain the same? Um, they they're the same. They they don't care how many people are packed onto the bus or standing over another customer that's sitting down. And um, I just had an argument yesterday with the transit over uh, one of the operators that got written up. He refused, he had uh, 41 people and he got to the next stop and it was like another eight people. And he told them, I'm not putting them on. They're gonna be standing right over us. And they didn't care and they wrote him up. He got two violations that I'll deal with today after I get off this. But um, it's just, uh, you know, everyone, everyone tells you social distance, social distance, wear a mask. Neither thing is happening on the bus, you know, neither one. You, you don't have to wear a mask and you don't have to social distance. Well, are the two things that everyone keeps telling you to do, except for on MTA equipment. And and no pun intended, but it must be particularly hard on Staten Island to, to, to achieve those goals as well, considering uh, the, not just the, the political climate, but the fact that that's a transportation desert that everybody has to take a, take a bus. Right, as, as as in Queens, and 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 so you're packing it in, and, well, and then, open it up and and and, and have it with the sandwich. You know, and, and yeah. folks that, you know, considering that you're already going to be packed on, and then the inconsiderateness of people who decide that they don't want to wear a mask, and there's no such enforcement, puts puts your workforce and, and your, your membership in a, in a particular dangerous situation. It, absolutely. And, and we're getting a lot of flack from the customers because there are some customers that do not like the overcrowding and they arguing with the driver. Why are you letting this person on? Why are you letting this person on? But if they don't let them on, they get in trouble. So they're either going to fight with the transit or they're going to fight with the customers or fight with both. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And, and something has to give because, uh, like I said, this virus right now, we're, we're, uh, uh, 
it's spiking. It's it's and and somebody walks on without a mask. I mean, it's very disrespectful, disrespectful to the driver and the rest of the customers that are on the bus. So uh, you know, we're trying to be fair to everybody, the, the customer and to enter the and make sure the driver is safe and can go home to his family without catching this uh, dreaded virus. Is there, is there, you, you know what? Uh, okay, to the to to, to the committee, uh, folks, and then then therein lies a LS for us, uh, a, a low guideline, right? Uh, that we mandate a low guideline for for uh, public transportation during uh, the pandemic uh, that is consistent with the governing bodies uh, for uh, a recommendation for for social distancing. Uh, and, and, and sometimes when you can't educate, you have to legislate, and that's why we're here. That's why we're kind of also having this conversation so we know what, what needs to be done. So I, I want to thank you. I also want to, Alice, um, I, you know, uh, I, I think this might be the first time that you guys are actually testifying and and, 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 and welcome you to the world, uh, the new di executive director, but also the managers uh, who are, are often, you know, <laughs> not recognize, they're just telling your membership to just go out and do it and, and, and lead by example. Um, and and uh, so you have a voice in this space as well. Um, and, and, you know, we want you to understand that uh, this committee, that this body, this, this, this family of, 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 of leadership here is, are here to support all of us. And you can't have weak links. You know, we certainly can't have people, uh, one body um, uh, group uh, doing work that another group has already refused to do, right? That undermines the integrity of, of what we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, we, we thank you for the work that you're doing and, and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you to this this, this panel. Um, any questions from my colleagues? Let me see. Thanks real quick. Uh, and the answer is no. So can you uh, please call the next uh, panel, please, Tom? Sure, sure Chair. Uh, moving to the next panel, uh, we will be calling on Mark Anthony Espinoza, Jeff Oceans, Irene Liu. We will now hear from Mark Anthony Espinoza. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Mark Anthony Espinoza, and I've been a 32BJ member for 13 years. And I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to testify. I'd like to begin by offering my heartfelt condolences to the families of 32BJ members lost to the coronavirus pandemic. My thoughts and prayers are with those survivors dealing with tragic loss of loved ones and coworkers. I myself have lost eight family members and friends to the virus, including my 95 year old grandmother and my 67 year old father the day before his birthday and both of it was eight days apart. The damage of COVID-19 highlights the differences in our city's workforce. While the race to contain the virus continues, white collar workers are able to move their workspaces to their homes as states ask employers to offer flexible work arrangements. Unfortunately, this is a very different lived reality than us blue collar workers whose jobs require them to work in person. In addition to being disproportionately exposed to the novel coronavirus, these workers are also more likely to experience lack of access to quality and affordable health care, poor working conditions, and, explode, and exploitive management policies. Day in and day out, essential workers continue to show up despite these circumstances and keep our city running. 32BJ represents workers across numerous divisions, including airports, commercial, residential, security, and schools the latter of which I have worked in for 15 years. Yes, I am a school cleaner. In my experience as a cleaner, earning a prevailing wage and having access to quality, affordable health insurance has been crucial to my family's security, especially during the pandemic. Because of our health insurance, my wife was able to receive support throughout her pregnancy. And we were able to safely deliver our newborn daughter who turned two months today. As a new family, we are not burdened with the cost of an expensive hospital bill. Because of the benefits I get from my job, 
we can live without any worry. My heart goes out to workers who don't have access to workplace protections, such as hazard pay, health insurance, paid time off, life insurance, or disability, disability benefits as they navigate working in person through the coronavirus pandemic. We owe proper compensation and benefits to the essential workers who put their lives at risk to ensure that New York City will survive and recover from COVID-19. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Jeff Oceans. Time starts now. Greetings, Chair Miller and committee members. My name is Jeff Oceans, and I am the president of Local 3005 of DC 37 ASME. I represent uh, research scientists at the DOHMH and the criminalists at OCME. I wanted to let everybody know that, you know, while seeking reasonable accommodations through EEO have been done, but they not have been so favorable for us, especially in terms of seeking uh, help with childcare. We do have a majority of, let's say about 70% or more of our membership at OCME are women, and this is a concern for us. We do need some kind of clarification because when our members are filing for EEO accommodations, there seems to be a distinction and we can't seem to get a clear answer between what's called a reasonable accommodation versus a special accommodation. We would appreciate some help. We would appreciate some help regarding that. In terms of our criminalists, at, you know, our criminalists at OCME are tired and exhausted. Their mental health status is of serious concern. Being denied annual leave is not acceptable, which seems to be now an ongoing concern. Taking criminalists and placing them on the front lines of morgue operations is a serious concern. And this is something that has to be addressed as well. We are referring our members to DC 37's PSO, PSU unit for assistance. So that is one way that we're helping out our members there. Please realize we were successful in securing vaccinations and PPE for our members, especially those that are working the pods during this vaccination process, but there's still more that needs to be done for their protection. Also, please be aware that our members were not eligible for any of the benefits tied to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act because our members were deemed essential employees, which is another concern. In terms of being inequitable or in terms of being fair, I just need to say that we do have our CRIM ones at OCME who have been reporting to work every day due to their job functions and they have not been given the opportunity to work remotely like some of our other members have been able to do. Okay. And uh, in closing, we have had our city research scientists working at the public health labs on First Avenue since the pandemic started and our criminalists assisting the community with the unfortunate deaths of family members, assisting them. All I need to say is that our members should not be forgotten. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Irene Liu. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Miller, for convening this hearing today. My name is Irene Liu from the California Republican Conservative Party. Irene, you're coming in very low. If you can adjust your audio, please. Is that better? Yes, it is. Go ahead. You lost your audio again. No, it's not. Uh, okay. Now you're good. Stay right there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. They'll be discussing the inequitable impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Bottom of the income ladder have borne the brunt of the economic fallout. 
Welcome, New Yorkers, especially those living in the last few months of the pandemic. More precarious position than they were in during the COVID pandemic. Low income residents in these two borough counties have been hit with the worst of the pandemic. Have also been hit pretty hard. Those who have been left out of the COVID pandemic. Sorry, oh, excuse me, Irene. I think you're, I think you're uh, coming in a little low. If you mind moving a little closer to the screen. I don't know what's wrong with our audio. Yeah. Could 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 we get back to her, uh, Tom? And I know we have a written testimony, but can we get back to her when the audio is is adjusted, please? Sure, we can move on. So we, that... we would immediately put her to the front. <clears throat> and before we go to the, is that the, the final? She the final on this panel? Yes, that would be the end of this panel. And before we get to the next panel, I, I just want to I'd be remiss if I didn't be, before President Francois. Uh, President Casella leave. You know, I want to thank them for the work that they're doing with their membership. I've actually uh, been in the room while they were holding uh, Zoom meetings with 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 their membership, uh, having a conversation about access to vaccines, what that looks like, and and getting in. And, and so, um, and and I kind of. What do you call a photo bomb when you just jump into into the conversation, right? I just show up on 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 on, on in, in the middle of their meeting, and 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 just you know use this committee and this resources to help because the work that you're doing is so absolutely important. And I I'm told that the administration is now um, watching via live screen, but they're not on with us, but they're watching via live screen stream. I want to make sure that you know i wanted to ask them what they were doing to assist membership and get the word out about access to the vaccines as well because i know that i've i've been on with with uh president sean uh, francois d francois the first and, and and president casala and 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 them really encouraging their membership and kind of navigating the rules helping them to get, navigate the rules of engagement and accessing vaccine and and, and many others so um, if 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 uh, the administration can can chime in and, and send us what they're doing to um, encourage and uh, um, the membership to to participate, but give them in, what information that they are giving them around uh, the vaccine for those workers that are one A and 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 one B uh, in doing so. And again, I just wanted to thank before we left. Uh, uh, those two presidents who I know firsthand that I've, you know, kind of crashed their meetings and, and they were doing a great job in disseminating this information uh, and access to their membership. So thank you. Uh, Irene, are you with us? Yep. I'm, I'm using headphones now, so I'm hoping that there you, you guys go. can hear me. Okay. Sorry about that. I should have been doing that from the start. So, um, so I won't. Morning time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I won't rehash some of the statistics, but just, you know, kind of mentioning that just low income New Yorkers have just been hit really hard along with New Yorkers of color. And even despite an expansion of um, unemployment benefits through the Federal CARES Act, our survey data found that this relief was not reaching those who were most impacted by job loss. More than half of low income New Yorkers who lost employment income were not able to access UI benefits. Our survey data also found that Latinx and black New Yorkers, as well as those in the outer boroughs were also far less likely to receive this aid. Um, only 53% of Queens residents, 53% uh, of Queens residents did not receive UI benefits compared to 22% of those living in Manhattan. And 56% of Latinx and 55% of black residents did not receive UI benefits compared to about a third of white residents. And without government relief, low income New Yorkers who lost their paychecks are twice as likely as those who did not lose income to experience housing instability and to face health hardships such as loss of health coverage. We must continue to prioritize expansion of programs such as fair fares and right to counsel to help cushion the blow of the pandemic. We also urge the council to focus on a more targeted approach to recovery that will connect residents and hard hit communities in the Bronx and Queens to good paying jobs. Um, so as you know, many have talked about, you know, before I me, mean, the pandemic has highlighted this critical connection between public health and worker health. We found that COVID-19 infection rates are actually highest among workers of color, not surprisingly many of them who work in essential face-to-face -face jobs. 40% of Latinx, and 30% of black workers we surveyed said that they or a family member had been infected with the coronavirus compared to only 19% of white workers. 
and many workers of color said they were worried about being exposed to COVID-19 on the job. Half of black and 40, 45% of Latinx workers said that they were, they were very concerned with contracting the coronavirus at their current workplace compared to 35% of white workers. And to protect the health of our city's essential workers and really the health of all New Yorkers, we continue to ask the council to pass intro 1797, um, which would require the Department of Consumer Worker Protection to produce posters for voluntary display at pharmacies and healthcare locations around the city, informing New Yorkers of their right to job protected paid sick leave. Paid sick leave laws can help prevent the spread of COVID-19 by enabling low income workers to stay home without fear of losing their jobs or paychecks, but only if workers know about them. Our survey data shows that they don't. Um, only 39% of low-income workers said that they were familiar with the city's paid sick days law. Um, you know, nearly six years after you know the, the law was rolled out, and we just overall just continue to urge the council to prioritize a more inclusive recovery for a city, and by addressing the needs of low-wage workers and workers of color who are hit hardest by both the economic and the public health consequences of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. That's what I'm talking about. See, that's that was well worth the wait as well. Uh, so that, that that was really an important data. As, uh, also, um, 1797. Uh, uh, I'm I'm having conversations with with uh, Council Member Levine and the Health Committee, and and uh, I think we'll be voting that out in the very near future. That is a very important legislation, um, and and we are definitely working collaboratively. To make sure that that information is disseminated, disseminated and that workers know their rights, right? And, and and that is very important. So thank you to to the panel. Um, uh, thank you once again for being here. The information is 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 critically important. Please to uh, stay continue to stay tuned. Uh, we don't have the chat feature, so you can reach out directly to the uh, um, Civil Service and Labor Committee, which is. Uh, where you receive your invite and email from. And uh, we'll put that out, make sure that we send out uh, uh, that information to each and every one of you. So thank you. Next panel, please. Moving to the next panel, we will be hearing from Dalvani Powell, Gloria Puma, Yesenia Mata, Eric and Eric Antikal. We will now hear from Dalvani Powell. I'm starts now. Good afternoon, champion. Chairman Miller and members of all the Labor Committee. My name is Dalvin Powell and I'm the president of United Probation Officers where I represent a little under now, a little under um, 800 probation officers and predominantly fem females and minorities. Um, I wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today regarding the impact of COVID-19 and, and its effects on my members. Under normal circumstances, probation officers working, work is challenging. COVID-19 has made the situation even more challenging. Our members work seven days a week to guarantee public safety the members of the United Probation Officers Association and Adult and Family Services since COVID-19 hit persevered despite the safety and health challenges they face as they never stopped performing their core central functions and continue to provide vital services and resources to probation clients and the community at large. Public safety is our primary focus. With that said, the members of UPOA continue to make field visits in some cases, working side by side with NYPD FBI, U.S. Marshals, and other law enforcement brothers and sisters. Members of all, all officers are required to report to the office at least one day of, out the week. Our frontline officers continue to conduct intake, intakes and prepare investigation reports as well as other reports for the courts. The supervision officers' virtual contacts with the probation clients have, have been enhanced. Although we are trying to work more effectively and efficiently remotely, many of the members are not properly equipped with the department's cell phones, laptops, which means they have to report to the office more often to get their work done, which is another um, safety issue. Nor do we have the appropriate vehicles like other law enforcement agencies as our cars have no partitions, no safety partition between them and the um, probationers should have to return somebody on the warrant. When we, when we were ordered by the mayor's office to monitor a group of inmates from Rikers in hopes to de decrease the spread of, vi of the virus among the staff and inmates on Rikers Island, the Department of Probation administration with the consent of this union reinstituted the electronic monitoring program. The EM unit has also been a beneficial, has been beneficial to our probation clients as it provides another layer to give those adult probation clients who are in violation status or is not complying with their probation to remain in the community, receive services while closely being monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, instead of being placed in custody and risk being infected with the virus. 
However, the officer who, officers who are assigned to this unit are the ones who are risking their lives by going to the homes and shelters to place the monitoring device on the individuals, setting up the equipment, and they are the first to be present any event there is an alert or if they suspect the device has been tampered with in any way. In addition, the members of UPA have gone beyond their call of duty by working at the department NEON, which is known as the Neighborhood Opportunity Network sites, by making sure those in need are supplied with food and, need, and if need be clothing. During the holidays, my members delivered turkeys to the homes of their probation clients and brought, brought joy to many families. Time expired. Two, no. Okay, two or three times during the year, the officers partake in one of the many DOP's intervention programs known as UFRAP, where they work along, along, along with youth and young adults who are on probation. And despite the, or despite the pandemic, the officers are committed and continue to mentor these groups. So I understand the department has been supplying PPE for the office and for the, and for the cars when the COVID-19 hit. When the COVID-19 hit, this union did a massive distribution of PPE to our members, such as masks, face shields, and gloves. We now have incorporated in our welfare fund to reimburse our members for the PPE that they purchased. Along, although, there, although there are not any clients reporting to the office unless warranted, we have asked the department to install plexiglass on the desk of each officer, as we, put, as we have to protect ourselves from each other as well. Today, the department has purchased a plexiglass. However, they are requiring the officers to share the plexiglass and transport the plexiglass from where it's being stored to their desk and then return the plexiglass after it's been used. Unfortunately, COVID-19 does not discriminate and we have had several members who have, been con who have gotten um, infected with the virus and we lost one to the virus last May. Recently, we have been seeing an uptick in these numbers who have an, an, an uptake in the members who have been um, positive with the virus. There's a major concern among the members who are assigned to work in the courthouses as their cases, as the court, as those who work in the courthouses, cases have continued to rise. We follow up with the department regarding the cleaning of locations where they where there were positive cases, and they report to us by saying that they're in CDC compliance with CDC, but we have no sure way of knowing if that's true or not. Recently, when the first when the recently when the city first offered the vaccine to to first responders, it was very challenging for my members to make appointments. However, once we relayed this concern to the administration, they made sure additional provisions were now available where the officers are able to take vaccines at the Soma, Soma, Soma's vaccination city employee hub sites throughout the city. Once again, the members of UPA continue to step up and volunteer to work at the city run COVID vaccine hubs, also known as the point of dispensing or pods, where they provide security, conduct check-ins and other functions to make sure that those who are eligible to receive the vaccines are, are able to do so and that the process runs smoothly. We are not sure how many members have been vaccinated thus far, but we have recommended to the department to consider having the health department do on-site vaccines at the work sites such as the NEONS. Um, we will continue to maintain contact with the um, administration through our monthly labor management meetings and other means of communication. Um, I want to also say that I support the um, early retirement um, package um, that's been talked about as many of my members are uh, predominantly mid fifties and over and they continue to do strenuous work and drink and dangerous work. Um, the option to have remote, um, to continue to remote work, remote, have all city workers to work remotely, I think is essential because of the unknown, for example, 9-11 and now we're faced with COVID-19. And I also have been asking about the ventilations, the vents being cleaned, and we all should be, um, be uh, um, we all should have the opportunity to have hazardous pay. I thank you for this opportunity. If you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now hear from Gloria Puma. Time starts now. Yeah. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Gloria Puma, soy miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral. Estoy acá para hablar en nombre de las trabajadoras del hogar que se han mantenido al frente durante, de la, durante la pandemia. Llevo seis años trabajando en el área de la limpieza. Han sido seis años de lucha contra la comunidad jacídica, en donde nos aún nos pagan a 11 dólares la hora en donde aún no nos quieren proveer con nuestro equipo de protección necesaria para protegernos de los fuertes químicos que se usan para desinfectar el área. Durante la pandemia, 
muchas de nosotros nos quedamos sin trabajo, ya sea porque nos contagiamos del COVID-19 o porque no teníamos donde dejar a nuestros hijos, ya que las escuelas estaban cerradas y no teníamos cómo pagar una niñera. Fueron unos meses de lucha sin trabajo, sin dinero y dificultades de la nueva norma de la escuela virtual. A pesar, a pesar de exponernos al contagio del coronavirus, teníamos que continuar con nuestra labor como trabajadoras del hogar. Fueron meses muy difíciles porque varios de estos empleadores de la comunidad jasídica no creían en, en el coronavirus. Algunos empleadores no nos dejaban usar mascarillas dentro de sus casas. Esto nos hacía aún más vulnerables al virus, ya que las familias estaban en casa. No solo nos poníamos, nos poníamos a nosotros, sino también a nuestras familias. Las condiciones de trabajo cada vez son más inseguras e inhumanas. Desde años atrás venimos luchando contra estos empleadores abusivos ante un salario mal pagado donde no nos pagan días de enfermedades y estamos expuestas al acoso sexual porque a, ahí nada no nos ampare como, los, como las demás industrias. Por medio del proyecto de justicia laboral he aprendido sobre mis derechos laborables, capacitándome, tomando varios cursos como el OSHA 30, el ST y también a salir a trabajar mediante el centro de contratación por el cual es más respetado por los empleadores. Por todos estos años de lucha, queremos ver que seamos escuchadas y pedimos urgentemente protección básica para poder trabajar con seguridad y dignidad. Nuestras peticiones son simples y muy posibles, salarios justos y razonables, protección de la industria, trato digno por la parte del empleador, acceso al equipo de protección de salud y seguridad. Somos miles de trabajadoras del hogar las que enfrentamos estos problemas. Poco a poco nos estamos uniendo, organizando y luchando. Aquí estamos y no nos vamos. Time expired. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria, for your testimony. We will now hear from Yesenia Mata. And I am the executive director of La Colmena. La Colmena is an immigrant rights in, and day labor organization based in Stein Island. It focuses in part in providing immigrant workers with legal services, SST and OSHA training, and PP equipment so they can work safely. Uh, throughout the pandemic, La Colmena has maintained its doors open. And through this, we have seen firsthand how our immigrant workers have been in the front lines but have been excluded from any sort of relief. Throughout the pandemic, we have been also uh, seen, seeing how immigrant workers do not have the privilege to stay home like some. Many have become sick because of COVID-19 or have lost a loved one. Had it not been for La Colmena providing PPE, food distribution, uh, bringing economic support directly to immigrant workers, including providing COVID testing in partnership with NYC Health and Hospitals, I wonder what would have happened to them. As many are afraid to get COVID tested at a site they are not familiar with due to language barrier and being afraid of becoming a public charge and or their information being shared with federal agencies. And there was no job security before since day laborers are immigrant workers who work day by day. It's even worse now. I wanted to be on this hearing just to emphasize that Without the labor of immigrant workers, the city of New York would not have been running. I hope that we can count on your support, Chairman Miller, for the Day Labor Coalition, a coalition that consists of five organizations, one in each borough. Since we have been in the front line supporting day laborers, domestic workers, immigrant workers, and your constituents as well. And I also hope that during the rollout of the vaccine, that immigrant workers are not once again excluded. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Eric Antikal. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for the opportunity and thank you, Chair Miller. 
Uh, my name is Eric Antical. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Programs, Non-Traditional Employment for Women or NEW. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, in New York City with a 42-year record of transforming economic prospects for women through careers in the building trades. For 15 years and beyond, uh, the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York and its affiliate unions have set aside apprenticeship opportunities for graduates of NEW, 85% of whom are Black or Brown women, whose incomes are on average tripled simply by starting their careers in the building trades and who obtain uh, a, a skill set that allows them to uh, cement themselves in the middle class. Um, these careers are so important uh, that they're unionized. They offer uh, middle class wages and benefits and safety protections that are even more important now during the pandemic, um, as long as uh, there is representation that counteracts employer abuses and uh, and uh, issues with their, uh, with their safety protocols. So in the, obviously the effects of COVID-19, as others have mentioned, have been pervasive across all, uh, already marginalized communities uh, and news community is no exception. Um, this crisis has been devastatingly disproportionate uh, for women. Um, in the month of December, 2020 alone, uh, black and brown women lost a net 160,000 jobs while uh, their white counterparts, both white men and white women actually gained net employment. So statistics like these have persisted throughout the pandemic, and there are uh, few opportunities outside of workforce development organizations like ours and unionized careers like our partners in the building and construction trades to reverse those uh, to reverse those losses. Now, uh, what I what I also want to drive home here is the building trades uh, unions have been uh, staunch advocates for worker safety as COVID cases have risen and spread throughout the city. They've been distributing PPE, doing additional cleaning, making sure there's enhanced site safety controls um, and city efforts uh, and employer efforts to restore our economy must be done responsibly with apprenticeship requirements, with strong worker protections like those provided by unions like those in the building trades so that we cannot just recover but blunt the effects of future catastrophic uh, losses in future crises like COVID-19, climate change, um, and all the crises that, that New York City has weathered over the years. Uh, we definitely encourage uh, federal stimulus funds and city efforts on capital construction, building retrofits, setup of emergency health facilities, uh, new building operations protocols and other projects to be conducted with union labor um, so that all New Yorkers, regardless of background, can build a stable life for themselves following this immensely challenging year we've all endured. Um, and I, I, I do want to express, you know, on, on behalf of our uh, friends in the building construction trades and, and other trade unions around the city, uh, you know, thank you for the time and uh, let's, uh, let's keep uh, investing in, in our communities by, uh, by investing in our labor unions uh, and in our, in our worker protections. And thank you all for the time. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now turn it over to Chair Miller for any questions for this panel. No, I, I, I just want to thank, once again, I want to thank this panel uh, for being here, but in particular this panel, because the diversity that they introduced, uh, which is really a microcosm of what the workforce here looks like, and we're talking about, uh, you know, how do we protect workforce uh, during COVID-19, but it's also about how services get delivered, protections, compensation, uh, and support equitably, and 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 clearly, you know, when we talk about immigrant workers, we talk about gender, uh, we talk about race. That that there that has not always been the case, and so we are hearing today so that we can magnify and and rectify um, those injustices that are occurring to those who continue to serve us and make our lives seamless each and every day. So I do have a question when when, when we talk, and and you kind of uh, miss um, Miss Monta, you you kind of touched on it. When, when you mentioned the, the hesitancy, hesitancy around um, certain uh, testing and, and, and other benefits that are brought to the immigrant community. Um, so I know, uh, particularly with day laborers, they continue to gather. We know the locations in, of, 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 of where they um, head, kind of headquarters from. Um, I, I have not seen the level of support here in the Jamaica, greater Jamaica area. Uh, that I represent for, for, for those day workers, particularly around uh, uh, PPEs and, and, and testing and, and ultimately vaccines for those workers, um, because it's almost business as usual. Clearly, they have to earn a living and support families like all of us, um, but uh, they cannot, uh, for the sake of humanity, continue to operate in a silo and not 
be tested because these are the people that are ultimately going back out and 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 having a great uh all the work that they do requires public contact right and so it's certainly we we have to make sure that we're making that connection and that they feel comfortable enough in receiving these services as well. So anything that we can do, uh, please let us know whether it's mobile testing, kind of meeting them where they are. Um, tonight we're doing a forum multi-language on vaccines. Um, so anything that we can do to be supportive of this panel, uh, please let us know. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman Miller, and I will bring this back to the Day Labor Coalition. As I mentioned, they consist, it consists of five organizations in each borough, and we all provide the same services working together to uh, reach out to day laborers, domestic workers, in general, just immigrant workers themselves. So I will definitely bring this back to the coalition so we could get in touch with your office. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank, you to, thank you to this panel, and we'll hear from panel number six. And then our final panel. Uh, checking for council member questions and seeing none, we will move to the next panel. As a reminder to council members, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will now call on the next panel, which will consist of Ligia Guapa and Muhammadu Aliyu. We will now hear from Ligia Guapa. Your time will begin now. Um, thank you so much for having me and the opportunity to testify uh, today, my name is Ligia Walpa, and I'm the executive director of the Workers' Justice Project, which is also part of the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. Um, a one, as you heard from Jesenia, one of the worker centers that has also been providing emergency relief center, I mean, relief services to day laborers, domestic workers, and food delivery workers. Um, and the reason I'm here, um, it's because um, it is important to highlight the many challenges that um, workers are experiencing in low wage industries. Um, in New York City, a growing number of working people, especially low wage workers, black and immigrant communities are, for, are being forced to take on gig jobs. Sorry, <laughs> are forced to take on gig jobs with no essential, uh, essential rights. Um, just this month, the city just reported that um, the number of gig workers has increased by 60%. Um, why is the percentage of, of people leaning towards gig, uh, towards the gig economy is growing exponentially? Um, um, these are the the reason is because these are the only jobs available in the market, um, and all low wage workers can only rely on these jobs um, to be able to survive the crisis. However, these jobs don't offer prosperity nor better opportunities for workers. These jobs are turning a large growing number of New Yorkers into day laborers and, human and humans um, without rights. Um, let, let's just look at some of the fast, fastest growing industries um, um, where mostly um, immigrant undocumented indigenous communities have been working as essential workers during the pandemic. Um, 80, like 80,000 app, app based food delivery workers are being hired as gig workers by giant tech companies like DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber, and other, um, and other um, billion dollar tech companies. While these companies are making billions in pandemic profit, they're denying the most essential basic right worker protections such as the right to basic leave, uh, minimum wage, the right to a safe workplace and access to bathrooms. In addition to being denied the most essential rights, the NYPD has failed to respond to the multiple reports of violent e-bike robberies and traffic crimes. And only three months, in only this month, three delivery workers have died. And every day they get, they're violently attacked. With all due respect, Chairman, um, uh, also, City Council has failed to protect them. New York City Council has not allowed, has not, has not hold these companies account accountable, nor it has stopped them from from them to keep abusing and exploiting them um, during the the worst possible time. In addition to food delivery workers, um, there is more than two hundred thousand domestic workers in New York City. You just heard from Gloria, who not only has been left out, has gone unemployed, um, but has not been 
um, be able to provide economic relief. And she's been forced to clean homes and disinfect New Yorkers' homes without safety equipment, without medical insurance, without the um, and I'm just going to end here um, just by saying that there's 72,000 immigrant construction workers who are also left out without um, safety protections. And we hope that, you know, most of these workers are able to get the right protection, but at the same time, being able to get vaccinated. Because at this point, delivery workers, domestic workers, uh, deliver, um, even um, construction workers are being left out of any possible support that this government can do. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Muhammadu Aliyu. I will begin now. Can we unmute uh, Muhammadu, please? Yes, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, all the committee members. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammadu Aliyu, and uh, I'm a New York Taxi Worker Alliance member. And uh, I'm talking today in front of you as a, a, medallion, a medallion owner driver, a taxi medallion owner driver. And uh, I'm really, uh, we are looking for help. Uh, we are we, we are desperately looking for it because uh, before COVID, we were already struggling. We were deeply in trouble before COVID. Uh, we lost, uh, and then as COVID hit, we lost uh, almost 90% of uh, our business. And uh, we still have uh, a big loan to deal with. So we have been uh, begging, we have been asking for help. Uh, since uh, like uh, almost two years ago now, we've been uh, asking for help and uh, nothing really been coming. We are not feeling nothing and we have to deal with uh, this big loan. So uh, we have been going after the mayor to get a debt forgiveness. I believe uh, Mr. Chair, you should, uh, uh, you have uh, an idea about that, about how we're struggling. And then uh, nothing really been, um, we are being ignored, and then uh, no, it seems to me like uh, no one is listening to us. Uh, and uh, I don't think uh, this is right. It's like uh, we are being denied justice, even though uh, everybody knows about what really happened to us. It's like uh, we lost our livelihood, we lost uh, what we really live for. And uh, I'm here today to urge you to really, really take uh, immediate action to really look into this, how we can get debt forgiveness. Because uh, without that, I think uh, the yellow industry, uh, being in ownership with a yellow industry will uh, will be finished. It will no longer exist uh, because uh, with COVID, it's like uh, we just get buried. COVID just bury us alive. And then uh, this is very sad. This is, uh, this is uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very troubling situation. Because what happened is like uh, you come here with a load of dream, and uh, once uh, you about to live your dream, and then uh, it's been like uh, been taken away from you. You've been uh, robbed out of it, and uh, I believe uh, the city council can do something because uh, if the mayor is not listening, I think uh, the city council should listen to us and then uh, try to help us. Because now it's not really about uh, looking for help. We begging for help because we are desperate. Uh, since COVID hit, most of us are no longer going back to work. And I think it has to do, all these things has to do because uh, most of us is like a community of immigrants. And uh, it's like uh, we've been taken advantage of. But uh, bottom line is we are part of here. We are American. We are citizens. And then I don't think it should be a crime for being an immigrant. And I think our city council should really help us here to get a debt forgiveness by working with New York Taxi Worker Alliance, which I'm a member of. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. I'll now turn it over to Chair Miller for any questions. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Brother Mahamadou. Um, 
and uh, Sister Guadalupe, um, for, for your powerful testimony and, and, and words about an often forgotten demographic in, in, in our city and, and whether or not, you know, uh, we're reaching our target audience. That, you know, pre-COVID and during COVID, we talk often about those dis disenfranchised uh, communities, right? And, and there's been a big hoopla about who ultimately were essential to our city's existence, right? But, but we have to find a way to back that up. Right. And, and, and the work um, that you're talking about, um, those impacted domestic workers and, and others, you know, we, you know, we, we have a, a, a bill, uh, quite frankly, I think that would be impactful that uh, has, has, has not uh, been voted on or, or heard um, that that I believe would have an impact. And, and, and so I would encourage uh, uh, my colleagues to support. I know it was a letter of support that went, up, went out the last few weeks. Um, and the majority of the members of the council uh, are a part of this legislation. So we're looking forward to getting that passed. But I need the vigilance that and the voice that uh, uh, is occurring here today to stand up, continue to stand up and be consistent. Um, and you don't always have the type of uh, support, advocacy and, and, and dollars behind some of the groups that, that hear their voices. But I think what has been demonstrated that these demographics of often marginalized workers are the ones that have made our lives so seamless and, and given us some semblance of equality of life while risking theirs and their families, and that we do have a responsibility. And I uh, look forward to working with uh, each of your organizations in the future to make sure um, that that is happening. And, and for Brother Muhammadu, um, uh, for, for, for the Alliance specifically, um, I, you know, I, I obviously on the Transportation Committee, there's a number of initiatives that we have put forth. You know, some have come to fruition, some have not. Uh, some just have not been enough. I, I would employ uh, that small business services. Uh, listen, you 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 are a minority business owner, and 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 there are resources that uh, address uh, specifically uh, business owners of, of of community business owners of communities that were greatly impacted, and want to make sure that the voices of the yellows are being heard within that sphere and any other other space that you fit into. So we're gonna to continue to work with each and every one of, of the groups that are here. Um, our information is, is, is in. Uh, if you have any ad additional information, but we're gonna be also reaching out to you specifically to kind of deal with some of the nuances of, of what you put forth today. So thank you for your testimony. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to our final panel, seeing no questions from other council members. As a reminder, if there's anyone present who wanted to testify and has not been able to, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and we will call on you after this panel. For the final panel, we will hear from Jonathan Pete Dorton and Hilda Salcedo. We will now hear from Jonathan Pete Dorton. Your time will begin now. You're on mute. Could you unmute, uh, Hi. Jonathan? Am I unmuted? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, my name is Jonathan P. Dorton, and I'm part of a group representing 850 non-union employees laid off at the Times Square Marriott Marquis. I've worked there for 16 years and we've been furloughed since March, 2020 due to COVID and lack of hotel business. December 9th, we received a letter from Marriott informing us that our jobs were being terminated as of March, 2021. These are employees who have worked here an average of 25 plus years at a time when unemployment will be running out and the job market has not bounced back. 
we will have no medical benefits and no jobs. Most of these 850 non-union employees are of a certain age where finding a new career is almost impossible. We will have no way to provide for ourselves or our families. We've dedicated our lives to this hotel and we are part of New York City's backbone. We were part of the hotel that brought Times Square back to life in the 80s. Marriott is posting profits and opening hotels all over in other countries and we're struggling to feed ourselves and our families. We are a diverse group of employees from every race and economic background. We need right of recall legislation, which would enable us to get back to work when the pandemic ends. This has to go through sooner than, sooner than uh, later. We are running out of time. This legislation was already passed in Los Angeles, Philadelphia, New Haven, Boston. We are one of the hardest hit cities in the world. I love my city and we need right to recall for hotel workers and workers all over NYC. This legislation would give laid off employees a right to their jobs back when business resumes. This would affect hotel, restaurants, bars, club, music venues, sports venues, retail, Broadway theater workers. We know tourism is coming back at some point. Hardworking employees deserve an opportunity to get their positions back after all we've been living through. Just help us and our great city. We need right to recall passed and we beg of you city council members to hear us and help us. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Hilda Salcedo. Unmute Hilda. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Hilda Salcedo. I came to New York at 15 years old from the Dominican Republic. I have worked at the Marriott Company since 2000 in two different hotels, which were both non-union. I was there on 9-11 at the downtown Marriott cleaning after the breakfast buffet and helping guests deal with the shock of what was happening. When I was going through that shock myself, I left long before, long after the evacuation, and I was caught in the middle of the North Tower collapse. I was there a few years later when the back blackout happened. During the recession in 2008, I was there as well. On Sandy Head on 2012, right up until the city was forced to evacuate, I was there lifting things off the floor because we knew we would be flooded. One month later, I was terminated, offered one week per year severance. And we were also outsourced by a company that rented the space to employees. We were, which got three hours, $3 per hour with no benefits. Three months later, I was rehired by the Marriott Marquis on February of 2013. I was there 2019 at the last blackout of the city. Again, keeping my guests calm, giving them food and water when I wasn't calm myself. I was there on December 2019, sick as a dog with fever and a horrible cough that felt like I had water in my lungs, never calling out because we were too busy to stay home or go home. I was sick for a month. Then rumors of COVID came. I was sure I had dealt with the virus in December, so I assumed I would be okay. I was furloughed in May and March of 2020, along with 1,200 of, of our employers, our employees, and stayed home with my when my husband could not. He is an NYPD surgeon. Being a first responder, he instead worked extra hours because we because of all the officers who got sick and because of the BLM protests or the Black Lives Matter protests. In April, I began to feel sick again. And sure enough, I had the virus. Both times my husband had no symptoms and still kept working. He was told he could not quarantine unless he felt sick. I dealt with the virus and symptoms for at least two months. And I still feel like I have asthma sometimes, even though I never had respiratory problems before. I lost my brother to COVID in June. 
I would lose my job this March. This time, the company changed their severance package to 10 weeks max. Should I keep going? Yes. Okay. So this time the company changed their severance package to 10 weeks maximum. This summer, this past summer, knowing that they would let go thousands of workers. I am 44 years old with no union protection in a market where 99% of workers uh, of hotels are unionized and will prioritize their members before non-union applicants. Thank goodness for unemployment, but still I used to make double what I receive now and it will stop in March, including medical insurance for my coworkers since I am protected because of my husband being a first responder. No stimulus checks since both of our incomes combined from 2019 passed the threshold of $200,000. Now we are preparing to sell our home. I am a waitress and a bartender. The hospitality industry has been most impacted by this pandemic and we need your help. I need my job protected when things get better and not be replaced by someone else. Please pass right to recall legislation to stop companies like Marriott from replacing or outsourcing their workforce under the cover of this pandemic. I also want to mention that the area that I worked at has been um, working basically on a construction that is worth $100 million and the construction is not over yet but they took the advantage of the COVID pandemic to keep the employees out for more than a, than a year. And this is the excuse they're taking. Thank you for your chance to testify and I will answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for thank, your testimony. Thank, thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, is it, uh, so, so clearly this goes beyond, um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning now that it goes beyond the hotel industry, right? It's, it's a little broader than that. And specifically, you know, it was brought to my attention early on, the right to recall uh, was, was dealing specifically with, with the hotel industry. And, and, um, and so, you know, that, that, that uh, adds another layer us, that, that we, we will be taking up here in the council. Um, obviously, you know, you guys saw you guys on the call for the duration and we've done it and had an impact in, in, in a number of industries, whether it was uh, uh, the grocery store, grocery worker retention, uh, building services and, and, and others uh, and, and, and ensuring that folks had the opportunity to, to return to work. Um, you know, we're going to be looking, the committee's already looking at the specifics of the impact on workforce and, and bargaining units here in the city of New York and what we can do to be supportive. Um, and um, we'll be reaching out uh, with, with uh, you guys. And I know Peter has reached out to us. Uh, Peter has reached out to us and, and, and look forward to uh, having this discussion as we contour some protections. Uh, on behalf of, 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 of this workforce, but all ensuring that we're protecting all the workers of the New York City workforce. Uh, so um, look forward uh, to working with you. And, and, and so um, Marriott, what, what is the percentage of in, in, in Marriott of unionized workforce there? So um, Marriott Marquis is non-union and we, we had tried for, uh, a while to bring the union in, but not everybody wanted it. And, and so right before a pandemic hit, there was talks that we were gonna go union and then the pandemic hit and we were furloughed. And now um, the leftover housekeeping department, that small amount of workers have reached a union um, recognition with the union. And, and they, furloughed all of us, but then they kept those housekeepers and then they terminated us. And now they, they terminated all of F and B, but kept the housekeepers that were left and they made them union. So we're left out in the cold and we, we've tried and we even had to take classes 
<laughs> that were mandatory saying that uh, we wouldn't go union. We had to sign that we wouldn't sign cards. And, you know, we had to really? pressure that we would never uh, go union on us. And now, you know, we're left out here high and dry and we have, <laughs> we have people to feed, you know? <laughs> we were basically promised that we would get union, um, comparable union market value for us to stay out of the union or even better, they promised us. For years. And then come to find out is not the truth. <laughs> and we, we know, we knew this. That's why we tried to fight it. But it yeah, was, that, yeah, yeah, that was, that, that was, you know, wow. Um, I, I don't know who was doing the organizing on, on behalf of the union, but clearly, you know, history will show us that that's just not the case that, you know, having been an organizer as well as, as many other hats that I've worn in, in organized labor that, I, 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 that I've seen major corporations spend millions to keep unions out. And if they'll spend the money to keep you out, then it has to have great value that, and that is, you know, uh, kind of hindsight in, in this case. Um, but when there is an organized, ongoing organizing drive, and and people attempt to subvert the right to organize, um, then that's something that that we uh, here at the, at the committee, as well as obviously uh, on a local level, but uh, you know, national uh, labor board uh, should be addressing that no one. And uh, Chairman Miller, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, but that's why we are pushing for this right to recall legislation. You know, it's worked for other cities and, and I'm sure, you know, once everybody got their jobs back, I'm sure it would change everybody's outlooks on unions and non-union and, you know, and we just need a fair chance like everybody else, you know, we've been here for all these years supporting this city and now we need, we need support. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll be talking with you in 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 the near future. Thank you. Um, and Thank you. Uh, I I suppose the hotel trades. Uh, who, who's representing the union? Who's the group that was attempting to organize? There, well, this um, there was a group that went from one of the restaurants, Crossroads Restaurants. There was another group from uh, Event Services. Um, and some of the housekeepers, as well as the banquet department, they all went to the union, Local 6, and requested to, to be a part of the union. And the union kept saying that, no, that there wasn't enough, that they needed more housekeepers. You know, they, keep, they kept being sent back. Um, this was all the way up to January of 2020. So it was way before the pandemic really made it to New York. So their excuse at the hotel is that they, we are out because of the pandemic. But in reality, we had a scheduled construction that started in May and it's not even finished yet. So we, we don't understand why we are being furloughed because of COVID when in reality, our area is being under construction still. And we were aware that we will be out of the hotel anyway. Um, but now they just taking the excuse to say, oh no, you are totally gone. And then basically either rent the space out to another company or I don't know. Maybe well, and that, that was the rumor that they're going to outsource us. And we've heard from numerous uh, people that they're outsourcing. So it would make sense for them to, to get rid of all of us and bring in cheaper labor. It's just, yeah. it's so, it's all so unfair. And that's why we, we just want that right to recall because it would help everyone. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, I'd be remiss, and, and I know I didn't see the hand raised, but I, I, I see Councilmember Adams have, have, have been there, just hanging in, and she's been taking it in. Um, I know what her constituency looks like, uh, this, this unionized, non-unionized, and, and immigrant workforce, and and uh, and not to mention that, that we're co-hosting a town hall tonight uh, addressing some of these issues, but I'd love to hear from her in closing. Uh, uh, just uh, about some of the things that 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 you see with your constituency, how um, as 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 a committee on civil service and labor that we can take this to the next level and be supportive. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chair Miller. Um, I, I didn't have questions for any of our panel, but you know we've been here 
Um, all of us have been here for just about four hours and it, um, it, I apologize for the background noise. I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> remote right now. Um, I just wanted to personally thank really um, everyone uh, that testified today. Um, it's been excruciating hearing your stories. Um, I can't even put a bow on that, um, but I'm so thankful that you shared them um, I represent a district that employs just about every, every edge of business that you all have discussed today. And it was just important for me to, to hear it all, to take it all in. Um, Jonathan and Hilda, you, you two with the Marriott, um, you just kind of solidified it all. For those of us that know how important a union is, and hearing your stories, it took me back to before I became an elected official and hearing the stories of Target employees, pretty much mirroring the same thing in the resistance to building a union, to creating a union, to supporting a union. And now to hear what that does to workers who are in a situation where they are just left to their own devices with no protection at all. I mean, if we don't have the fighting spirit um, to, 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 to take up the legislation that Jonathan just mentioned, I mean, shame on us. Um, I, I, just, um, I just really had to, had to say that we've been impacted by COVID. Um, some of my areas, some of my district, particularly Richmond Hill right now, is uh, seeing a spike again. Hopefully it's gonna start to flatten out, but those of us in Southeast Queens know what this pandemic has done. Those of us who have lost loved ones, I lost my father in May because of complications due to COVID-19. I say that every chance I get because whenever I can speak out against something and advocate for the greater good, I have to invoke him into the work that I do. So, um, we are having a town hall tonight on uh, the vaccine itself to educate our community in Southeast Queens, Chair Miller and I. Um, are co-hosting this. We're bringing in health and hospitals. Um, we hope that you know those of you that are in this um, in this hearing today, and those of you that are watching, um, will join us just to get the information. Um, and if you have questions that need to be answered, to have your questions answered. But again, for this panel, for all of you that have testified, I hear you. I appreciate you, and I thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller, for your time. Thank you, Councilmember Allen. Uh, is the Councilmember Rosenstall still on? I, I know I saw her. Anybody else, uh, Lewis, uh, anyone else from the committee that's on that want before we close out? Otherwise, I do have a prepared closing statement, but I'm not going to uh, have us all sit through that. We, we've been here um, for, for a, a great deal of time now. It was absolutely necessary that we talk about the state of labor. Um, and and uh, here in the city of New York during COVID-19, obviously it is it is broad and, and fundamentally uh, uh, in some areas not supported. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, that whatever services, whatever support happens by virtue of what we do, by virtue of what our city and its employees uh, deliver to the workforce, that it is done equitably. We've heard testimony in. Uh, that we've heard for a number of years in the disparities with happening within agencies. We've heard, you know, obviously uh, EMS once again talk about uh, the inequities that occur within the FDNY uh, as well as other uh, agencies. We, we saw that just as recently as last week, there was an outbreak in with three different city agencies and three different responses, right? And because of the lack of response, um, by an agency, by the way, that it just had a response in, in, in another facility uh, last month um, that is continuing to occur. But as we look at the demographics of the workforce and, and those that they serve, um, it, it is a continued perpetuation of, of, of privilege over those marginalized folks. And, and who make our lives so seamless. And it is our uh, responsibility to make sure that we, we are in some way 
uh, bringing some type of justice to to this these folks that are working so hard on behalf of New York City, New York State. So I want to thank everyone. Um, I'm, I'm, it was just uh, President Casella bringing home that still losing members and, and members are losing members of their family, 10 year old sons. How, how ridiculous is that? Because the, the New York City Transit Authority and MTA won't acknowledge that you cannot overload a bus, you know, and, and that folks and, and whether, whether it's food service delivery, uh, it is the folks working in the cafeteria in the schools and, and, and uh, the crossing guards and, and, and the people that are just performing these tasks every day are potentially infecting themselves, their families and communities. The people that are testified here today are those who come from communities that were most greatly impacted, that don't have the luxury of being, you know, professional, um, white collar professionals who have the luxury of working remotely. Uh, and, and, and we want to make sure that we're lifting that up, giving space uh, for all of us to have our voices heard and ultimately coming up with real solutions. And sometimes when, when education is not enough, we have to legislate. And, and I do, I, I think we, we, we've all seen a couple of legislative priorities coming out of here, LS is coming out of here uh, in the future. So I want, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank those that are still with us here today because this is that important of, of topic. Uh, uh, all of the, the presidents and the leaderships of local unions and organizations, uh, particularly the Vinnie Alvarez, Central Labor Council, and, and I see President uh, DeFrancois is, is still on the line, you know, and, and, I, and I will say this, that I, I believe I've used your saying more now in the last month than I have over the past few years in, in interviews and, and testimony that I've given. And that is when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, right? And, and, and that's what we in this movement have to do. We have to, we have adopted that mantra. And, and because if we gotta wait to get ready, it ain't gonna happen because you can see from powers that be, it, it's just not happening. So thank you all. Uh, for participating. Look forward to working with everybody. Make sure that you have the committee's uh, email and that we will forward um, the additional testimony to you. Any questions that you have, please get to us so that we can get it back to the governing agencies and make sure that the work is done. But I do want to also thank uh, the administration. I want to thank DCAS, OLR, and uh, Worker Protection uh, for, for uh, being here uh, with us today and working collaboratively to make sure that we're keeping workers and those that they say serve safe. So thank you again. And thank you to committee staff, uh, Nusat and, 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 and Tom. Uh, thank you so much to my staff. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for uh, the work that you've done on this hearing. And with that, uh, I am going to close the hearing. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. brothers and sisters. Look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.